Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, March 13th, 2014 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Uh, I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and we'll begin our meeting by having the clerk call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Blue Duvall. Present. 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 Mr. Downey Mosh. Present. Here. Mr. Here. Mr. Andrew Here. Mr. Present. Present. Okay, we have a quorum. So the next item on our agenda is the public comment period. And I note that we have a number of people who signed up to speak in public comment tonight, and I have the list, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll call folks up uh, by the list. And if you could just identify yourself by your name and your address. Um, and, and by our rules, I will use the um, three minute timer this evening. Uh, so that the iPad edition, uh, so that you can, uh, so that everyone has an equal opportunity to make their public comments. So I'll just ask you to respect the time and uh, so that other people have an opportunity to speak. So Mr. McBride, Alan McBride, I think you're the first speaker. My name is Alan McBride. I live at uh, 547 Audubon Road in Leeds. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Madam Superintendent, members of the Northampton School Committee, uh, Principal Lombardi, Principal Wilson, and uh, other school officials, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, two years ago, as we know, uh, JFK Middle School eliminated advanced math classes. At the time, those changes were put forth as being designed to allow more students to take advanced math classes when they entered the high school in ninth grade. That expectation and, and uh, promise was set, set forth many times in many forums, uh, including at this uh, school committee. Two weeks ago, uh, we learned of a very different plan. Um, many of us had been pinning our hopes on those um, advanced classes in ninth grade, so I hope you can uh, understand uh, why we were alarmed. Um, I have one daughter in eighth grade and two sons in seventh grade. We've lived through the change here at JFK under uh, five different teachers. Um, it's an experience that's fallen short of expectations in many ways, but I want to focus on one. We don't know what happened to the objective of placing more students in advanced classes in ninth grade. But worse than that, um, the change has actually resulted in no JFK students receiving the needed instruction. In fact, two weeks ago we learned that only those students who had self-studied material would be able to enter honors geometry. Now the proposal considers extending this change through ninth and 10th grade. And our concern is where will, we, where will we be two years from now? If the experience is the same, I think we'll have done this, these students' edu educational progression real harm. We need to review what went wrong in the implementation of the change. However, JFK is a good school. Before the change, JFK routinely prepared as many as 40 students per year for advanced classes at Northampton High. We have a threshold question, what was wrong with the change itself? And how do we avoid making the same mistake again? So at this time, therefore, I respectfully submit that we should not move forward with the elimination of advanced math instruction in ninth and 10th grade. The risk and likelihood of harm of, doing, of taking that move are too high. Thank you for listening and thank you, thank you all for your services to our city and our school. Thank you. The next speaker who signed up is Michaela O'Brien. Hello, I'm Michaela O'Brien. I live at 33 Longfellow Drive and I have two sons who attend Northampton Public Schools. My eighth grader here at JFK loves to learn and is willing to work hard but he wants more academic challenge. We are seeing very little tiered instruction as was promised two years ago and have expressed our concerns to the school administration several times. We were told that there is professional development for teachers to learn differentiated instruction and that the team teaching model is using those principles. But we are not seeing this in the quality of work that comes home or the in-class instruction. I am not blaming the teachers. I understand the pressures they are under to, a, to teach to a wide range of student abilities, 
without the full support of consistent in-class mentors, materials, time, and other resources. In fact, I would like to recognize the work of two terrific JFK teachers who have made engaging work available to interested students in their free time after school. I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to Holly Graham, who led the Scholastic Writing Class competition and who enthusiastically greeted the five JFK winners at the awards ceremony in Boston this past Saturday, and to Will Bangs for leading the Geography B Club last fall. Their volunteer after school time to make these programs happen is greatly appreciated. However, overall, I am extremely disappointed at the lack of options available to Henry and his peers who want to work at a more rigorous pace. And now given the news that there will be no ninth grade honors or English math at NHS, I'm concerned for many reasons. These curriculum decisions affect all Northampton students and they directly impact the constant financial drain on our school budget. The reduction of honors and advanced offerings significantly erodes the reputation of JFK and NHS and leave students who can handle more challenging work to wait until 10th grade. More families will choose out of, schools, out of district schools if their demand for advanced courses is not met by our public schools. Northampton will then pay more tuition to charter schools, adding to the $1 million net charter school deficit already on the books. This cycle would continue until we admit that the Northampton public schools are not serving students at every level of academic capability and that true differ differentiated instruction needs the proper support to make tiered learning successful. Until these changes are realized, our policy choices will continue to siphon off families, involved families and their children who want to work at a higher level of challenge who go to other districts. I'm asking that you work to restore the advanced level options beginning in seventh grade. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker signed up is Becky Olander. I, actually, Becky and I just traded. That's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's fine. Is this? Without using our three minutes, can we just ask about the volume? Can you all hear everyone speaking? Mm -hmm. Okay, you can There's hear. There's quite a loud fan back here, and it's hard for us to hear. We have a speaker over here, but this is all we have. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so everybody can hear over there as well? Okay. All right, start the timer. Uh, uh, you, you start talking, I'll start the timer. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, Ms. Superintendent, members of the school committee, Principal Lombardi, Principal Wilson, Mr. Brennan, Ms. Stavely Hall, everybody else who I've forgotten. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Lisa Chase and I have two daughters. One's a seventh grader and one's an eighth grader. Like the other speakers who've gone before me, we came to, had a great experience in elementary school and came to JFK with high hopes as we actually moved to Northampton in part because of the school system. We looked at Northampton, we looked at Amherst, and we bought a house here because we heard Northampton had great schools. We've been very disappointed by the experience at JFK. Uh, so disappointed, in fact, that our eighth graders still at JFK but we've sent our seventh grader to a charter school. Throw tomatoes, I know, I feel like a traitor taking money from the Northampton schools and it's not something we wanted to do. We never ever thought we'd consider charter schools or private schools, anything like that, but after our older daughter's experience at JFK, we felt that we had no option if we wanted to really find engaging and challenging classes. Our seventh grader is now at Pioneer Valley Performing Arts, which is not exactly known for its math. We, we weren't expecting a, a great math curriculum there, but we're pleasantly surprised that she's in, a, they're, they're working on it though, and she's now in a seventh grade advanced math class, and she actually has now surpassed what her sister in eighth grade is learning at JFK. There's a bit of uh, rivalry between these sisters. I know some of you know them. So usually it plays out on the field hockey court or, or, or in lacrosse, but let's just say her older sister does not appreciate her younger sister surpassing her in math. We're hoping that's gonna be rectified at Northampton High School. 
And, I, and we're looking forward to seeing what the new plans are. And we know that decisions are complicated and there's a lot of factors to take in, into account. Um, one other piece I want to emphasize is that this isn't only, this doesn't matter only for the kids who want to be in honors classes. One of my daughter's friends who's at JFK, um, she sees a tutor twice a week just to try to keep up with her class in math because the support and instruction in her current class at JFK, it's not enough for her. It's not working. The, the um, differentiation within the classroom is not working, certainly for my daughter, but it's not working for a lot of other kids all along the spectrum, and especially on both ends of the spectrum. So I appreciate you taking these considerations under concern. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, in accordance with the trade, Becky Olander is now uh, is now the next speaker. So um, I'm Becky Olander, 96 Chestnut Street, Florence. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to speak in support of our local schools and students. I'm a former high school English teacher. I did my student teaching at NHS, and I currently teach composition at Westfield State. My husband is from Northampton and attended public schools here, as did our oldest child, who capped off her experience with four great years at NHS. We want the same for our son, currently an eighth grader at JFK. However, I'm concerned by the loss of advanced math in JFK in seventh and eighth grade two years ago, and the impending loss of honors level English and math in ninth grade at NHS. I'll focus on English tonight. Current ninth grade students who signed up for honors English last March showed up to their first day of classes in September only to find out that they had been placed in heterogeneous classes. They were given the option to do extra work as an honors component, which has been implemented with varying success. Last month, your committee voted to remove writing from the NHS graduation requirements, creating a new hybrid English 9 course that incorporates more academic writing. In pitching this change, the superintendent didn't mention that honors English was also being eliminated, including the extra honors option within classes piloted this year. Yet parents of current eighth graders, many of whom are here tonight, were given a handout at the info night at NHS on March 4th, stating that one of the reasons for your approval was that, quote, ninth grade students, um, English class, I'm sorry, ninth grade English classes will be heterogeneous, end quote. Communication has not been great regarding this issue. Some students enter high school ready for the rigor of an honors course. They are often the same kids who are in the musicals, come to your board as student reps, and play in the band and on sports teams. These kids are already motivated and working hard. They don't need more homework in the form of an extra essay or additional math problems. Excuse me. They need instruction that takes them from their level and challenges them to move on toward the next level, which is what any child at any level deserves. NHS administrators promise all students will have a rigorous differentiated education. That hasn't happened universally at JFK. That hasn't, has not happened universally at NHS in English this year. Next year offers an unleveled hybrid English 9 class with writing added. NHS administrators promise it will be a success, and though we want to trust them, we do have legitimate reasons to be skeptical. The latest NEASC report lists one of NHS's strengths as, quote, opportunities for students to challenge themselves in AP and honors level courses. If one of the high school's greatest strengths is its honors courses, why decrease them? One of NHS's own 2013 and 14 school improvement plan goals is to increase low income students and students of color enrolled in honors and AP courses in order to decrease the achievement gap. They list three ways of doing this, including increase the number of students entering the ninth grade honors English classes from 60 to 70 percent. For the 2014-2015 school year, it looks like NHS is settling for zero percent of students taking honors English 9 since that class will no longer exist. Ninth grade honors English was targeted as a place to increase honors enrollment and decrease the achievement gap, and now that course has been eliminated. Thank you for listening, and thank you for all you do for your service to our schools. Thank you very much. You. The next speaker is Nancy Whittier. Hello, thank you all. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm Nancy Whittier. I live in Bay State Village. Uh, I'm the parent of a son who graduated from NHS last year and is now a freshman in college. Had a, he had a wonderful education in JFK and NHS, and I'm also the parent of fifth grade twins who I hope will have the same experience. Um, I too am 
here to express my concern about the district's changing approach to accelerated or leveled or honors instruction. But I'm going to speak about the policy more generally. I don't have an eighth grader. Uh, I wanted uh, to ask for you to think more generally about what the district's approach to this question should be. You've heard from others that by next fall, the Northampton Public Schools may no longer offer any leveled instruction until 10th grade, um, possibly no leveled math instruction until longer. Uh, whereas just a few years ago, leveled instruction in math began in seventh grade. This is a dramatic change, but it seems like it's occurred course by course in a kind of ad hoc way without systematic discussion and consideration by the school committee and by the leadership of the schools. So I urge you to really take the time to carefully consider at a broader level what our district's approach to these issues should be. I want to raise a couple of specific issues. First is the question of how to meet the needs of all our students, including those who learn quickly uh, or who have advanced understanding. As you know, if you've been in a classroom, it is really hard to differentiate math classes effectively for the top and bottom 10 or 15 percent. Uh, second, academic challenge isn't just important so kids move ahead quickly. It's important so that they develop good study skills and habits of mind where they learn that they need to work hard. Things, not everything comes easily. Uh, and then third, there are significant equity issues around the achievement gap in the way that the current uh, accelerated math plan has been, has been put forward. Um, there's no uh, advanced math teaching at JFK. So students who want to take advanced math at the high school have to test in. They can test in if their parents can hire a tutor or if their parents are highly educated and can teach them at home. But the bright, high, potentially, high potential students from uh, less advantaged families are not going to have that opportunity. Um, I think instead we need a better system for identifying a broad range of students um, who have the aptitude and the interest to do higher level work. Instead of doing away with leveled instruction, we need much stronger identification and more flexible pathways at different points in time for students to enter into whether it's leveled math or honors English. Um, Finally, I understand there are different opinions about what the school committee's responsibility is for determining these kinds of policies. Uh, I am not a lawyer. I am a sociologist. Um, regardless of whether you vote on them or not, I would urge you to thoroughly discuss them and to weigh in. Um, if you're asked to vote on something, you know, the move to integrated math or whatever, think about what does that mean, what, what's your position in terms of the leveled instruction. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Nat Reed. Hi, my name is Nat Reed. I live at 33 Longfellow Drive, and I have two kids in the system. Uh, one is in eighth, about to go into ninth. Um, and he, like myself, is very disappointed at the changes that are being proposed for ninth grade. Um, and I'm frankly worried about what life is going to look like for my current fourth grader when he hits JFK. Um, but I want to talk about the, the larger problem. I don't think we're going to convince you tonight, but I do hope that you'll all think about fixing the larger problem. I understand that uh, you have a classroom with incredibly divergent talent in it. Um, I have a friend who's an eighth grade teacher. He's got kids reading at eighth grade level. He's got kids reading at third grade level. He's got kids reading at twelfth grade level. That's really complicated. Uh, and the old solution, of course, was tracking and honors. And I understand the administration has issues with that uh, and uh, that they want to replace it. My concern is that they're taking it away before they're coming up with a proper su uh, substitute. Now, they say they have a substitute, which is differentiated instruction. Um, but I can tell you from having seen real differentiated instruction in other districts and also seeing the work that my student is doing, my son is doing in eighth grade, that we don't have real differentiated instruction in Northampton except for at the margins where you get a real masterful teacher who figures out how to do it on his own. Uh, but the good news is that there's a school right in Westfield, uh, Franklin Avenue School, that is doing real differentiated instruction. You walk into their classrooms, any classroom, you don't see one teacher talking to one group. You see the kids broken up by ability into five, six groups, working at, independently at stations. They're all engaged. I saw second graders doing work that was more challenging than what my eighth grader is being asked to do. Um, 
The kids are so engaged that they're happy, their discipline problems are actually lower as a result, and their scores are going up as a result. But here's the thing, they don't just say differentiated instruction. They have made a huge commitment, and I don't think we have in Northampton, any of us, a real commitment to, to changing the way we educate. In, in Westfield at this school, they brought in coaches who are in the classroom every day. They have commitment from the superintendent all the way down. They have new curriculum, they have new furniture, and they've worked at it. Most, most schools that pull this off, it takes them five years to do it. So uh, I would urge all of you, in fact, I have a handout that went around. I would love it if you would go look at the Franklin Avenue School in Westfield, Massachusetts, so that you can see what real differentiated instruction looks like. Because I think when you go into those classrooms and you see how happy and excited and engaged and smart those kids are, you're going to say, we deserve this in Northampton too. And if they can do it, we can do it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Matthew White. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, school committee, Superintendent Nash, and teachers and administrators. It's a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Uh, my name is Matt White. As uh, Mayor Narkowitz mentioned, I live in Florence. I presently have two children, both at JFK. Uh, and I'm here with a, with a very focused purpose to express concern about the potential elimination of accelerated math under the new integrated math curriculum proposed for Northampton High School. And I wanted to lend to you both a personal and a professional perspective on that change. Uh, I have taught statistics and mathematics courses for more than a dozen years at many different levels. And in my experience, there are some students who get it quickly at any level and they are ready to move faster. When a school offers accelerated math options, those students remain engaged, they remain motivated, they remain connected. When there are no accelerated math options to meet those students' needs, the teachers struggle with differentiation. I say this as a parent, seeing my child go through the JFK eighth grade experience now, and as a teacher who has struggled with this in my experience. It is difficult to differentiate. It is time consuming. I'm glad the speaker who came before me mentioned what he did because that is what it requires. And our district doesn't have those resources at our disposal immediately. As I look at the choices in front of us, I see the reality of what I've seen far too much, which is in practice. Unless a student who's under challenge, who's ready to do more now, has the luck to draw a truly exceptional teacher, and we do have some here for sure, but unless that happens, that student will often remain under-challenged because a teacher in math, which must progress linearly and sequentially through the topics, can only move as fast as the class as a whole can go. And students who are ready to do more inevitably end up with busy work to fill their time. This is not challenging our students. This is not making them rise to their full potential. My conclusion is that as a parent and former teacher, retaining accelerated cl math class options at every stage of NHS, particularly under the new integrated math curriculum, is the only real assurance we have that all students will be able to realize their full potential, that they'll remain engaged as they move forward. It's also something that puts much less of a burden on our teachers. The teachers can succeed. They already are worked hard. As you know, we have precious few developmental dollars available, but they can fare much better in an environment where we retain accelerated math classes for those students who are motivated and are under-challenged today. I'd also point to the NASC accreditation survey, which made a key point of pointing out that in Northampton, the availability of these advanced classes is one of their key strengths. Let's build on that, not discard it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, and thank you for your public service to our community. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, speaker is Deborah Keitch. If I pronounced that right. <coughs> Hi, good evening. Thank you school to the school committee for the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Deborah Keitch. I live at 30 Ravel Ave in Northampton. Um, I'm not here to talk about math, so forgive the the change of subject for just a minute, um, but it is a timely issue. I think I want to talk about the Park Field Test. Um, 
as many of you know, there's a growing national <coughs> and statewide movement against the park field test, against the park test in general, and against the associated common core curriculum. Um, and there is a group here in Northampton, the Northampton uh, uh, Public School Action Coalition, of which I'm a member. I'm also on the Bridge Street School Council, I should say. Um, that is coming together to address a variety of issues around public schooling here in, in the city, but um, particularly right now, uh, there's a lot of talk around the park field tests, around what to do around opting out, and I understand that the field tests have been pulled back, and now only two schools will be participating, and yet there are parents who do want to opt out of those, those tests. Um, there are school committees across the state that have come out uh, with statements about how they feel about the opting out, about the test in general, and about the Common Core. And I think for the work that we need to do here as teachers and parents and community members who are very concerned about that, um, we need to know where this committee stands around this. And so um, I would like to request that I want to know from each of you where you stand on PARC, on the field testing, um, and on the, the Common Core, but mostly about what your perspective is on opting out of the PARC field test this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is uh, Camille Kamek. My name is Camille Kamek. I live at 38 Terrace Lane. I would like to speak briefly again about the park pilot now planned for Jackson Street Elementary and JFK. I want to reiterate some of the concerns I raised last meeting and add a few additional thoughts. There are two issues I would like you to consider related to park testing. First is the damaging effect of high stake test standardized testing generally, and second are the problems associated with parks specifically. High stakes standardized testing is testing used to evaluate schools and teachers and deem children ready for high to graduate high school. Although standardized testing has been around for a long time, it is only since 2002 and NCLB and the Federal Education Policy enacted under George W. Bush that has been used to score schools and punish teachers. You should know that I am not advocating for the elimination of testing. I do not disagree with testing, including standardized testing, as a way to inform instruction. However, when testing is high stakes, it perpetuates the idea that schools are failing, it demoralizes teachers, and it turns classrooms into test prep factories. This is especially true for when schools have large populations of children who are poor, children of color, and English language learners. And it lines the pocket of for-profit corporations who create these tests and then produce and sell teaching materials aligned to the tests, and there is a lot of money to be made. According to some, park testing is the next generation of testing that will be used to make sure our children are college and career ready. When they, the park test is supposed to test higher level thinking and 21st century skills. My fear is that what the test really does is raise the bar in a way that is age inappropriate and therefore finds more kids and consequently their teachers to be inadequate and more schools as failing. When schools are deemed failures, they are closed, taken over and restructured. Teachers and administrators are fired and schools become places you would not want your children to be. In addition, we are being told that the park test is a tryout for Massachusetts and that the adoption of this test is still under consideration. This implies that by participating in the pilot, we will have input into the decision. I have to tell you, I feel skeptical. Commissioner Chester chairs the park consortium. The park consortium won $186 million raised to the top dollars to develop testing aligned to the Common Core. Park then in turn hired Pearson to develop the test. It seems unlikely that the group that received the race to the top money and then selected Pearson to write the test would decide after the pilot that they weren't going to use the test after all. The purpose of the pilot, like pilots for all standardized assessments, is for the de developers, in this case Pearson, to determine validity and reliability measures. So far, Northampton has been lucky. We have many children in our schools that come educationally advantaged, meaning they are likely to do well on standardized testing. But these things can change. We only have to look to what is happening in Holyoke to know this. Finally, the sky will not fall if some children in these two schools take the pilot test. But park testing, like the proverbial slow boiling of a frog in hot water, is ratcheting up the temperature on public schools a few more degrees. The point I am trying to make goes beyond this one pilot test. What I am say trying to say is that we have to pay attention to what is happening locally, in the state, and at the national level and take a stand. The current trends in education reform are threatening the institution that is at the heart of a democratic society, strong schools for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Susan Boss. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, my name is Susan Voss. I live at 89 Ridgewood Terrace in Northampton, and I have a daughter who's in 10th grade at the high school and a son in 5th grade. So I don't currently have an 8th grader. 
My daughter did go to JFK. I'm here tonight because there seems to be a radical shift in the availability of leveled, accelerated, or honors courses throughout our school system. The absolute highlight of my daughter's JF JFK experience was advanced math because it, she found it challenging. Two years ago, as you've heard, advanced math was eliminated with the promise that students would remain challenged via differentiation within the classroom. We've heard from numerous families ahead of me that this experiment has not worked. Kids are not challenged and have not learned enough algebra to feel comfortable taking the placement exam for honors geometry. Thus, in two years, we have gone from sending 30 to 40 students a year ready to take honors geometry to probably sending close to zero this year. There now appears to be a strong movement to eliminate all honors level courses at the high school in the freshman year. One driving reason given by administrators is the same given for the elimination of advanced math at JFK. And specifically, it's that less advantaged and lower income students are not well, well represented in these advanced classes. The thinking seems to be that by offering a reset point during the freshman year, the achievement gap will be closed and a broader range of students will view themselves as advanced level students. Now this is a great goal to get more ranges of kids in these classes, but what I think a lot of us are doing is questioning this idea, is ninth grade the right time to think that we're going to reset everybody? In contrast to that direction of having this reset year, um, there is a body of research that concludes that mathematics education in the U.S. needs to substantially increase its expectations for everyone, and that elementary school curricula in the U.S. are often one or more years behind those in other countries. This research is what should be driving the discussion related to the math tracks at JFK and Northampton High School. We have an opportunity within an economically diverse public school district to provide more advanced math to a far greater number of children. Instead of eliminating advanced study, we need to increase academic opportunities and rigor for students well before grade nine. The fundamental problem begins in elementary school. Um, when some children develop math skills much more quickly than other children. Currently, our district is asking kids who excel at math to both one, wait for years for others to catch up, and two, to sit through slower paced courses where they can serve as peer mentors. I think we would all find the following analogous proposal ridiculous. We, would eliminate, we could eliminate varsity sports teams in favor of providing opportunities for all students to learn a sport, and the best athletes could be called upon to help the slower athletes learn the sport. I don't think we want to go there in athletics or in math. Thank you, and thank you for listening. Thank, thank you. you. The next speaker is Jen Werner. Hi, my name is Jen Werner. I live at 16 Winthrop Street, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. I uh, personally am a, also an educator. I taught the public high school level outside of Northampton for 15 years, and I now teach at a community college. I have a daughter who is a junior at um, Northampton High, and I have a daughter who is in the eighth grade currently. Uh, so I feel like I'm kind of in a good position that I have a child who was pre-elimination of, of uh, leveling in advanced math and one that is post. Uh, what I have seen currently is that roadblocks and barriers are being put in place at the middle school level due to the lack of advanced math and lack of leveling of classes. And I'll give you a quick example. My daughter, who's a junior in high school now, is a very motivated learner. She w wanted to take super rigorous uh, educational programs. Sometimes we even tried to discourage her for the level of rigor. Um, she is now, as a junior, in AP Physics. The reason why, uh, which is usually a senior, uh, senior class, the reason why, and she's taking two Smith classes. The reason why she could access uh, AP Physics in her junior year is because she entered the, middle, uh, the high school at an advanced math level. Math level is critical, critical, critical in science education. My older daughter took uh, honors chemistry in her um, freshman year and then took AP chemistry in her junior year. That will not be available to my eighth grade daughter because she does not have the math levels. Uh, in the seventh grade, my daughter entered the seventh grade here at JFK one year ahead 
Uh, we tried all kinds of things. She has had fabulous teachers. I am not faulting the teachers. I am upset with the system. Um, my daughter uh, came home the other day from the uh, 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 scheduling placement in tears, in tears, when she found out that there was going to be no honors level classes at all. And she's becoming to the reality that she probably is not going to pass the get a high enough grade on the test because, as she says to me, Mom, I probably could do the math, but I can't do math that I haven't learned yet. So um, I really feel like at, our, at the community college level, all the initiatives we do are based on research. There's tons of studies out there. We, we look at studies, we decide on initiatives, and then we evaluate those initiatives based on data that we collect. I am not in the Northampton Public Schools, but I'm wondering if that is really happening. Um, I would like one good reason, one good reason why honors English is being eliminated at the ninth grade level and is that educationally sound. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Paul Voss. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, th thank you. First of all, I just want to thank you guys all for being here. I was on the planning board for many years. I know what it's like to sit here and listen to people. So I'm going to keep this short. Um, I teach engineering uh, at Smith College. I've been seeing the, where the students all across the nation are coming in uh, and all across, around the world are coming in in terms of math and science skills. And um, one of the biggest challenges we face is the huge uh, difference within our classrooms of uh, students who are uh, very poorly prepared and uh, often are international students who are extremely well prepared and it's an incredibly difficult environment to teach in and, and what that means from a practical sense is that um, that the bar is lowered that you can't uh, keep people from getting lost when they're not prepared and keep the, the students who are ready for more and challenged adequately. There's always a compromise. There's no free lunch. And, um, and so I'm concerned about the direction that the school is going in where we're eliminating some of the advanced options and the challenges, um, uh, particularly uh, in, the, in the math where we, we really notice that the U.S. students across the nation and here too are, are not ready to do engineering are not ready to, to do the fields that, th that we need to move our economy forward in the, in the coming decades. Um, and so what I'd like to just say that I, I, I would like you to hopefully consider uh, restoring uh, the advanced level options starting in seventh grade and, um, and also uh, to really, uh, in your role as an overseer of, of the school system, to to look for evidence and not just take it on word to say okay this experiment has been tried in, in the in the um, middle school where's the evidence where are the interviews how are the kids doing and and to look at, at, at how this is working because uh, anecdotally you can see it doesn't work very well there's a lot of uh, things that it doesn't work and I also want you to ask about process because I'm not sure that as a community we've been properly informed this has been going ahead with without uh, proper input and we've just learned about it it's sort of been happening under the scenes and I don't think that's the right way to move forward in an open community like Northampton of something of this great importance so thank you thank you Paul um, the next speaker is uh, Andrew Sorolnik hope I hope I read that correctly My name is Andrew Sorolnik. I am a parent of a sophomore at NHS and a uh, sixth grader at Hilltown Charter School. Um, uh, and I'm not going to apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the reason I'm here tonight is because my wife uh, took ill and uh, could not be here herself. So she wrote a statement and asked me to read it. Uh, her interest in this was um, developed because of an article she read in the uh, Gazette that suggested that the math changes that, uh, proposed for NHS are the, to make NHS uh, more in line with uh, the curriculum at the middle school. Uh, 
and uh, that uh, connected, she's concerned that connected mathematics is just a, is a follow-on to a uh, failed curriculum in the middle school. Um, no one has had the experience uh, that connected mathematics is more rigorous than uh, standard, traditional, differentiated instruction. Uh, the entire state of California banned connected mathematics from its public schools due to poor our outcomes in 1999. CMP was judged at least two years below grade level. After the 2000 uh, academic year uh, in California, state monies uh, were not allowed to be used uh, to purchase connected mathematics. Um, so uh, we're wondering why Northampton is using it now in 2014, despite a wealth of evidence that it's ineffective even for the weakest students. Uh, Hilltown Charter School uh, got rid of CMP after 10 years uh, when it decided the, uh, it had really, uh, it tried its best, but it had gotten poor results from the curriculum. And they adopted uh, a new middle school curriculum last year. Uh, the town of Amherst uh, uh, parted with a, a similar math curriculum called uh, Investigations Math. There are parent groups, science and math professors across the country who, mo who have mobilized against this kind of curriculum uh, because they want to encourage our children to pursue careers in math and science and not the opposite. Um, the math te textbooks currently in use at NHS uh, prepare students for careers in math, science, engineering, and medicine. And there are also non-honors courses uh, for the many students who are not interested in those uh, career paths. Now we're talking about really dumbing down math education uh, to accommodate the weaknesses that students are bringing with them from the middle schools. If I could just ask you to, to, to wrap yes. up, thank you. So um, my question is how can we ensure that uh, integrated math cl uh, classes have enough algebra um, and other uh, fundamentals to, provi to provide our students with what they need to advance to calculus and pursue uh, college degrees in math and science? Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker who signed up is Benjamin Cyrilnik. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Cyrilnik and I'm a sophomore at NHS. I've enjoyed my experience at NHS, but I'm worried about some future changes proposed for the next year. I want to address the problems with the proposed math program for NHS, Integrated Math. I learned from a similar program called Connected Math in middle school and would like to share my personal experience with the proposed math program. An example of a lesson from Connected Math is one in which the teacher attempted to teach scientific notation. Scientific notation is not an especially abstract concept and can be taught easily through learning a few simple tricks. Instead, we spent many days exploring scientific notation instead of learning how to use it. I found this incredibly frustrating and still experienced the repercussions at the high school. I do not believe that the answer to my lack of middle school math skills is to adopt a weaker program at the high school, but instead to adopt a more rigorous math program both at the middle school and high school levels. Thank you. Thank you. So that completes the list of folks who've signed up for this evening. Um, I think that's, I've got two pages here, so I think that's, that completes it. Um, so thank you all for those comments, and uh, we'll now move on to the uh, next items on the agenda. Um, announcements from the school committee, are there any announcements from any members? Okay. Hearing none, we'll now move on to the consent agenda. Uh, these are the items that are recommended to you uh, tonight on, on the consent agenda. We have several minutes for your approval. 
the school committee meeting minutes of February 19th, uh, 2014, the superintendent screening committee meeting of February 24th, 2014, school committee meeting of February 27th, 2014, the negotiating subcommittee meeting March 3rd, 2014, the superintendent screening committee meeting of March 3rd, 2014, the curriculum subcommittee meeting March 4th, 2014, and the budget and property subcommittee meeting March 7th, 2014. We also have three contract uh, contracts for your approval this evening. Uh, one is uh, to True Green uh, for the fertilization of NHS athletic fields, uh, $5,840. RNH Roofing uh, to replace the Ryan Road roof membrane, $138,566. And Jay Silesian Sons on Bridge Street uh, for bath, um, actually, uh, they're not located on Bridge Street. It's for replacing bathroom partitions at Bridge Street School, $11,660. Uh, $660. We also have two field trip requests. Uh, one is uh, for JFK eighth grade Latin students to New York City on April 9th, 2014. And then Bridge Street second graders uh, Connecticut Science Center trip to Hartford, Connecticut on April 30th, uh, 2014. So those are the items on the consent agenda and I would ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda I move to approve can I pull out um, RNH roofing please uh, uh, certainly you may so we'll pull off the RNH roofing uh, project um, so there's a motion to approve the consent agendas or a second? second second all those in favor of approving the consent agenda please say aye aye, aye. opposed any abstentions? So the consent agenda is approved. Uh, and then, uh, Ms. Duvall, you had a question about the R&H uh, roofing, which I actually believe was part of the capital, uh, uh, the capital plan. So I can ask uh, 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 Superintendent Nash to speak to that. Right, well, uh, my question was um, last time we had talked about the grant and the getting of the grant and applying for that. And I'm just wondering how that all falls in line with this and writing out this large check. Okay. Um, this is from the capital improvement list, and I think when um, Mr. Pomerantz was here last time, he mentioned that they had been looking at this over a four-year period at $150,000 each year in order to do the entire roof. Um, this is the first year that they've had capital improvement money. It was approved. They went out to bid this summer. They received a very favorable quote. This is for 30 percent of the roof. The MSBA application that was made is for the other 70% of the roof. Okay. So if we're able to get it, we can complete the roof all in one year. If we're not able to get it, we'll have to go back and do it piecemeal in terms of over four years. So it's not replacing it, but hopefully MSBA will help us finish the entire roof. Okay, I just wanted to um, sure. know that it wasn't threatening the grant at all. So this, yeah, no. if we do indeed get the grant, then this, then it's paid for with this. And no. the grant. This is the first 30 percent. The grant right. will pay the other 70 percent. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, I move to approve. If there's no more discussion, then. Okay. So there's a motion to approve that contract. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any further questions or discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Any abstentions? Okay. So that contract is approved. Um, uh, due to a combination of uh, illness and uh, the music man, we do not have a student representative here tonight, so we will um, we'll, uh, skip the student representative report. Um, the next item on the agenda is a vote on the 2014-2015 district calendar, and I will uh, turn that over to the superintendent. Okay. Excuse me. I was just wondering if it would be appropriate to move that until after the um, budget and property subcommittee update reporting on the Versatrans transportation analysis. Since that may affect the uh, item in the bottom right hand corner uh, of the calendar. Uh, certainly. Um, uh, hearing, hearing no objection, we can certainly move that item up. So this is a request to move up the report of the um, Budget and Property Subcommittee. Um, well, or move the Mr. calendar Meyer. after. Or move the calendar after. Okay. So Continue with the rest. Fine. Why don't we just move the calendar? That, that makes sense. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead and um, then move right down to the Curriculum Subcommittee update. Uh, and I'll ask uh, the Chair, uh, Mr. Sheflo, to, um, to give us that update. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
The curriculum subcommittee met last Tuesday, as you said in the uh, uh, consent agenda. The focus of the subcommittee meeting this time was on math, um, as we have found out here tonight. Uh, we were joined by uh, Principal Lombardi, Associate Principal Brennan. We also had Ms. Rachel Stavely Hale, math teacher, and Nancy Cheevers, our curriculum and assessment director. Uh, Superintendent Nash was there as well. The conversation started out uh, after the election of the chairperson uh, with a review of the Common Core and what the Common Core has in terms of an impact on math, mathematics instruction. Uh, after we talked about that for a moment or two, we went on to a discussion of the NHS math curriculum, which we've seen covered by many of the comments that we had here tonight. Um, and at the rather than risk uh, public embarrassment in terms of getting something wrong here myself, I know that we have uh, some of the experts here in the audience, and I will defer to uh, Dr. Nash and to invite our guests to kind of fill in some of the blanks. Um, we have with us this evening um, Principal Lombardi um, and um, also the department chair for mathematics at Northampton High School, Rachel Stavely Hale. Um, I think we'll start with Principal Lombardi and then we'll go to Ms. Hale. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk more about just the, um, the sequencing and the structure, and then I'm going to leave for the specifics in regards to the Common Core um, in regards to the curriculum. Um, to, expert, Ms. Stable Hill. Um, there seems to be a lot of myths out there about we're dismantling for support, um, our honors and AP level programs. That is not the case. Um, there has been no, no discussion whatsoever. In fact, this past year we added um, an AP psychology class. 24% of all our course offerings out of 130, about 130 classes, are AP or honors. So we are consistently looking to add AP and honors level classes. At the same time, we're trying to add other classes that our students will find interesting. Um, some people have mentioned, I'm going to segue for a second about the English changes. We're hoping next year to offer five um, electives in English that we think will be stimulating and exciting to our um, upperclassmen, journalism, creative writing, um, humanities, things like that. In regards to math, um, as you know, we, we have been, um, there's been discussions with JFK over the last, um, I think, eight years in a vertical t um, team. And uh, as, as JFK seg uh, moved to their CMP, there was natural discussion at the um, high school level. There's been discussion for many years and an excitement and a desire to move to an integrated math, which the um, math department felt would better meet the needs of our students um, for the Common Core as well as the demands for um, college as well as the demands of a workforce. That was, that was consistently something they wanted. The big thing that was stopping it was access to money. We found out this year that we would have the resources to move ahead and purchase the curriculum and the books, and the decision was made to move ahead with that. In doing so, right now we have a four-sequence math that I think everyone in this room has experienced. A typical Algebra 1, which is 1A, 1B at um, Northampton High School, Geometry or Honors Geometry, or al um, Algebra 2 or Honors Algebra 2. The integrated math would combine those concepts into a three-sequence math, integrated one, two, and three. Um, the benefits of doing that will allow students at an earlier time reach higher level math. There's been a lot of mention of higher level maths. There is no discussion at any level to dismantle or take away any of our upper level maths. If anything, Ms. David Hale and I were in discussion, how could we add more advanced math at the upper levels? Um, it is true that in this segue of moving from a four sequence to a three sequence, we would need to consider um, removing an honors geometry and algebra. That is in place for next year because the current freshmen are still in that four sequence. They will need that option. So that option for students of our eighth graders, incoming ninth graders, to still have access to the honors geometry or algebra two, that is in place for this year's incoming freshmen that has never been considered to be taken off the table for them. What is in question for the class, um, freshman class of 2015 is what do we replace the honors geometry, the honors um, algebra two with? And that is a discussion. Do we, do we replace it with an honors integrated two, integrated three? Do we create also um, an assessment process that allows students to skip over and go to the next section? That is the next step of the phase. So 
Yes, there will be taking the honors geo, geometry, and algebra two, but it will be, there is discussion, how do we replace that for those students? Questions on, on the sequencing aspect? Yes, yeah, just Specifically on the sequence, it was previously presented when the middle school math program was changed that one of the justifications was that instead of taking out four semesters to get through algebra 1A, 1B, geo, and algebra two, that the desire was to reduce that to three semesters uh, because the Algebra 1A would be encompassed in the Connective Math 8 program at the middle school. And I'm just wondering, what, what benefit, do you lose that benefit if you go to Integrated Math 1? I mean, students, do they skip over, they get rid of an Integrated Math 1 course or are they just they have to then take those three courses no matter I mean you have no you have no opportunity for differentiation then when they're entering ninth grade whereas now they could have choices between courses it sounds like you're going to everybody takes integrated math one even if they're at the top of the connected math eight or the bottom that determination has not yet been made at Maybe I'll join you, Brian. This is Rachel um, Stephen Hill, the math <laughs> department chairperson. Thank you. I'm keeping my coat on because I'm freezing. This weather's insane. Um, so we haven't determined yet what that's going to look like. Um, what we, when we looked at switching to the integrated uh, curriculum, um, it seemed to us that the most natural way to do that would be to phase it in and grandfather out the old curriculum. And so for our rising ninth graders for next year, for the class of 2018, they will still have the option of coming in and starting in honors geometry or geometry just as previous rising ninth graders have for this new class of 2018. Um, what will happen in subsequent years is what we have yet to determine. And the reason that we haven't been able to make that determination yet is because we haven't yet made our decision about which curriculum to purchase. I think a big problem that's happened is that we're on a very tight schedule. We only very recently found out, and I mean within the last month, that funding would be available for the purchase of new texts. We at the high school all of this year have been going through the process of trying to align our, our current curriculum with the Common Core Standards. And the thing that became glaringly obvious is that our existing resources were not sufficient to the task. That there were concepts that are now covered in the 9 through 12 math curriculum that our textbooks don't cover. And our Algebra 1 textbook covers content that's now considered to be part of the 7th and 8th grade curriculum. So our resources are no good for teaching the curriculum that we need to teach. Um, and so we were thrilled to receive news that we would have funding to purchase new books. We as a department have talked for as long as I've been a member of the department about having an integrated program at the high school. It was attempted once before, but it was run as a parallel track to the traditional track, and that didn't work. And from what I, from the research that I've done, districts that have tried running an integrated uh, program as a parallel track, it doesn't work well because what happens is the accelerated students go into the traditional track and um, it tends to fail um, and that's what happened at Northampton High School but there were people in the department who felt really strongly about the merits of an integrated program and the research is quite clear about the benefits of an integrated math program students who complete an integrated math program perform higher on standardized assessments than students who complete who uh, go through a traditional algebra 1 geometry algebra 2 progression the united states is behind on this one most other countries are using an integrated mathematics curriculum it is in no way a weaker curriculum the books that we're looking at are more rigorous than what we have right now they they cover more content and they cover more advanced content. They cover vectors, they cover matrix operations, they cover discrete math, they cover content uh, in statistics and probability, none of which is a part of our existing Algebra 1 Geometry, Algebra 2 progression, all of which is included in Common Core. So we're thrilled to have the opportunity to purchase new books. It's been exciting for us as a department to look and see what integrated curricula are out there. And at no point have we said that we are going to eliminate honors math courses. We very much want to increase enrollment in advanced math courses for all students. Common Core Standards increase the rigor of mathematics education. We cover a lot more content than we used to, and a lot of it is covered a lot earlier. Um, I'm excited about the potential that that opens up for offering more advanced math work to more students. Um, as for the success of what's happened in JFK, 
I, I would like to encourage the community to, and, and the school committee to be aware of the fact that among the people in the vertical math, um, the original vertical math team, um, at Leslie Wilson and Tim Levy and myself are the only people who remain. We lost a superintendent. We lost the department chair um, at the at JFK. We lost the department chair at NHS. We have been working very hard over this time period to try to make this transition as positive as possible. And I would like to remind people that um, we don't want to, to uh, provide students with a weak education. Our, our desire as math educators <laughs> is to lift up our students to achieve the highest level of mathematics possible. I'm a math educator because I love mathematics and I want everyone else to love it the way that I do. And it drives me crazy that as a culture we, we talk so negatively about it and we say all the time about, oh, I can't do math and, oh, that's so funny. It's not funny and it, it's not, it wouldn't be funny if you said that you couldn't read. I want students to love mathematics and an integrated curriculum for me will hook more students in because it's an active curriculum. One of the curricula that we're looking at, the opening unit, students get to simulate bungee jumping with rubber bands and weights. That's the opening thing that they do. The opening unit in my current Algebra 1 text is about isolating a variable. That's not as exciting. <laughs> so there's ways to hook kids into math and I think that an integrated curriculum really provides that. All that we're trying to do is educate people about the switch to the integrated curriculum. We have made no determination about how the honors uh, course will be handled because we haven't purchased a curriculum yet. Um, we're looking at some really great ones. We have a couple that we really like um, and we are glad to have comment from everyone about, about what curricula they like and, and um, we will keep everyone informed. We've tried to do everything transparently. I apologize that the rollout has been less than optimal, but our time has been so constricted that my first priority has been about how can we implement this effectively, and, and in all honesty, it didn't occur to me to think about the public relations side of things initially, um, because my focus was just on we need to start looking at curricula and thinking about what that's going to look like. So I apologize to the community that the rollout has not been a good one. Um, we've been doing our best to keep people informed. We have been transparent at all levels when people have asked me for information. I've return phone calls and emails I want to make sure that everything is is being done transparently um, and we're excited I, I think that the piece that's hard for us in the math department is we're really excited about this and the potential that it, it, it opens up to our students um, and and we voted unanimously to adopt an integrated curriculum it's something that we feel really strongly about um, and that we feel will be really in the best interest of our students in the district uh, Mr. Uh, Vall, and then uh, I think Visa started a question. Yeah, I. I okay. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll let him run. You run the meeting then. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. She That's I, okay, I, Brian. I you go for it. I wasn't sure. So I, I did have which, a question. Which, which committee members have questions? So That's fine. Let, he can. No, I'm, I'm just. I, I saw Mr. Vall first. So I'm going to recognize Mr. Vall and then I'll come back to you. So okay. go ahead, Mr. Vall. I just wanted to know that while the transition is taking place, what's happening to the upper percentage of the kids that uh, may already have it or, you know, not to be bored by the bungee jumping or maybe it's exciting for once, but they're way, well advanced above it. What happens to the kids during the transition? And then that was one. And then the other part was you were saying, well, it hasn't been, um, the rollout hasn't been optimal and everything else. Does that mean that some kids are actually losing out during this rollout? No, our rising eighth graders will still have the opportunity to begin in geometry or honors geometry just All as rising ninth grade, graders have in the past. Okay, uh, we, we really can't have uh, um, comments from the audience, so. You know, I, you know. I guess I'd like to say, unfortunately, um, you know, JFK has taken a lot of hits here, and, I, and we can't speak to that. What I can say is this, is that, you know, we're, we're a K through 12 system, and I can definitely say, as we know, that's been well documented, there's been issues in our elementary schools, middle school and the high school. No K-12 system doesn't have issues. The high school is a level one school. So if something happens with, along the way that our kids are being success, successful on the state mandated test, our college placement. And do we have things to work on? Absolutely. But we also have a lot of great things going on in our classrooms. And I really want to point that out because I, I, as, as I've sat here, I've really felt bad listening to some of the things that have been thrown at JFK. They work extremely hard, and we're very happy to get those students because the success we have with the students at our high school is based on what we get through a K through 12 system. And we want to keep the focus on that, on mentioning that. Right, but we've changed our system, and we changed it a couple of years ago with the, the CMB. How has that um, 
Uh, has that affected adversely some students so that now in ninth grade or tenth grade they're not getting or they're not where they anticipated themselves to be? I mean, is that part of the, of the flaw of the system? I mean, as we transition, how do we maintain the integrity of making sure that we're keeping, because we already have high advanced placement um, from our schools. We have that as far as testing out. So um, I would hate for us to see that in order to find out that it affected it, that the, the results go down. So I'd like, I'm, I'm just wondering how during the transition, and that was one of it, and then the other one was if during the transition, the past one that we changed into, we're noticing a difference now at the high school level with the integrated math. And I'm not talking about just in general, I'm talking about to address the general, but also the lower and the upper 10 to 15 percent, please. We can't speak as to the transition yet because it's this year's eighth graders are the first one who've been through this new mm -hmm. system. So we haven't gotten them yet. So I, I, I can't say based on experience. Um, it's this year's eighth graders are the first ones to go through the new progression. I, I also will note, um, it's not just our math curriculum that we're replacing. JFK decided to replace the CMP curriculum because in aligning the curriculum with Common Core, they also realized that it was not going to be one that they could align um, with the new standards. And so they're looking at a new curriculum purchase as well. Thank you. Mrs. Minnick? I, I, I'm, I'm having try. everything that you're saying makes perfect sense to me. I'm just stuck on the handout that was given us, the documentation, that just it says the old current sequence is for, for it has four little boxes, algebra one, algebra one, yeah. one A, one B, geometry, and then algebra two. Yeah. And then it says the new sequence is integrated math one, two, three, geometry, algebra. You said there should be an going, or between those really. Okay, yeah, because you, you said you were going from four to three, yeah. and it looks to me yeah. like you're going from four to five. And yeah. I'm confused. So if you just explain that. Yeah, it's just that for the rising ninth graders, for this year's uh, class of eighth graders, some uh, anyone who, through teacher recommendation and performance on the eighth grade math, math assessment, is recommended to go on to geom uh, geometry or honors geometry, will do so, and then will continue through our old curriculum that we're grandfathering out. The rest of this year's rising ninth graders class of 2018 would begin in the integrated one through three sequence and what the honors side of that will look like has yet to be determined um, and that will depend on the curriculum that we purchase in large part and so if they go through one two three have they completed geometry at that point they've completed the equivalent of algebra 1a 1b geometry and algebra 2 okay so the so they're ready to go on to trig or they'd go on to pre-calc or stats or you know yeah and this this the current model that wouldn't be available um, until junior year this yeah. this model will allow them depending on depending on how fast they want to sequence through it or, or their level would allow them to reach pre-calc honors pre-calc end of sophomore year and, and, and have exam. access to the APs beginning of junior year. So we think it creates options not only for our accelerated students, but it also opens the door for other students that might all of a sudden find an interest in this style of um, teacher. And for those of you who were here two years ago, one of the main arguments was that we wanted to open that door up to getting to AP Calculus in junior year to more kids because under the previous system only those kids who passed the sixth grade test had access to AP Calc in their junior year because of having the four semester course sequence a kid had to come in and do two semesters of Algebra 1, a semester of Geometry, a semester of Algebra 2 and a semester of Pre-Calc before they could get to Calculus which meant all the kids who didn't pass that sixth grade test couldn't get to AP Calculus before their senior year. And that's problematic because a lot of kids like to take AP Calc before they take AP Physics. Um, so one of the biggest drivers of the, the conversation two years ago was about how do we open that door up to more kids to get to AP Calc in their junior year. And so one of the things that was exciting about Common Core was that by rolling that Algebra 1A content down to eighth grade, we could offer a three semester course sequence at the high school instead of a four semester course sequence. Mr. Shelfo. Um, Brian, you mentioned college placement, and one of the things that came up at our subcommittee meeting was a concern about how this might look on a college, on a high school transcript. Will the colleges know what an integrated math sequence means? And I wonder if you could, you could speak to that. The information I've been given, um, yes, they would. And I will yes. let that, I mean, that, that is something we, we've looked at various reports and um, research from. Um, um, boards and um, committees made up of college professors, yes, this is something that is out there, it's very well known, absolutely. 
we also provide um, a profile of our school, which explains what we have and what it is about, so that is part of the process as well. Right, colleges see that school profile, and so they see which courses exist at an honors versus a non-honors level, which ones don't have an honors option, and they weigh that in looking at a student's transcript. Yes. And, and, and integrated math is, is not such a foreign concept in the United States at this point. There are more and more districts who are looking at it because it is the, the prevailing model in the rest of the world. Go ahead, Ms. Hennessy. Um, I got a letter from a parent today whose daughters were very successful at NHS, loved it, they went through college, they're getting the doctorates now. One of their daughters <coughs> um, ended up taking AP Calc um, and enough courses at Smith that had she been able to, she would have had a math minor. Can a student still do that? Absolutely, yes. We've always had flexibility in our curriculum for exceptional math students, always, so how, and that would definitely that continue. Now? How can a student do that? Generally speaking, this? when any of us have a student in any class at any level and it's immediately evident to us that their skills are beyond the scope of the course, we give them some kind of diagnostic assessment to determine mm -hmm. what would be the better course for them to be in. <clears throat> that practice would absolutely continue. We never have any interest in holding a kid in a class where they're going to be, you know, working at a level that's beneath what they're capable of, and, and there's no reason that we would ever want to change that and as well again the three sequence provides more opportunities for Smith for upper level and their schedule makes more flexibility as well um, mr. Meyer this is more in the form of a comment than a question when this was presented two years ago one of the things that was encouraging for me as someone who's taught math at both the high school and the middle school level is the level of vertical articulation was being increased, cooperation between the buildings was being increased, and I think that leads to greater student success. However, I don't think we're at the point where we know how that change has worked. I mean, you've just said, I don't know where those students have ended up. And it seems, again, if we are envisioning this as a K through 12 school system, <coughs> I'm, I'm not sure about the wisdom of moving on with the high school curriculum um, when we don't know where the middle school curriculum has ended up. And again, you know, it, the devil is always in the implementation. And I had discussions with parents about the di you know, success of differentiation, the ability to do successful differentiation based on, on you know, specific teachers. But I went back and watched the tape of our meeting from April 12th of 2012. And Mr. Moore asked a qu you know, question. Is the idea then that everybody at JFK would have had as much algebra as currently the 40 kids who are taking what's called algebra now? Paul Marcinic, department chair at the time, said, yes, yes. And he then said, the amount of algebra that is contained in the CMP program will cover all or 90% of what is offered in algebra 1A and 1B now. Then there was a discussion of the, the enrichment that was going to be provided. Again, because I think parents are upset because this is what they were provided with when they were given the change uh, two years ago. You then said in explaining enrichment, when we did item analysis of CMP compared with the Algebra 1A and 1B curriculum and we found where all those areas of overlap are, we were able to identify those few pieces that aren't covered thoroughly in the CMP curriculum. For example, and then you gave an example and you said, so what we do is create these enrichment components which we would place in strategically into the eighth grade curriculum, the eighth grade CMP curriculum, for those students who are ready for that kind of enrichment. So those few pieces that aren't in the 1B curriculum that are, that are in the 1B curriculum that aren't covered in CMP 8, those are what the kids would be able to do with the assistance of their teacher. I emphasize assistance of their teacher because I've just been informed as a school committee member that the ability to learn that 1B is not the taught curriculum. We were clear that students would need to learn the material independently. I think that goes beyond you know, poor public relations rollout. I think it goes to the heart of what you do as a public school system. And again, you know, raising the equity issue, this was presented to us as opening the door, right? as breaking open the door, not assessing students at the sixth grade level, which I, as a, as a math teacher, I thought that was pretty early, too, to make that kind of division. But if you are placing the burden on families to do the instruction, it, but that's what it says right here right. in this communication. Um, and if this, if this enrichment, these enrichment units have not, in fact, been created or not been instituted, then I'm just nervous about 
going through a thoroughgoing reformation of the math curriculum and math instruction in high school when we haven't completed our evaluation of how this piece has worked. I, I guess the first thing that I would say is that it's not a thorough re, you know, change at the high school. The, the content of the course, of the integrated one through three course, is the same as the content in an algebra one, geometry, algebra two course, resequenced but with new stuff added, like statistics and probability. That's driven by the Common Core standards. That has nothing to do with us. That's what's in the Common Core standards. I just, I just want to, because you sent, I was sent an article, Tar et al., that was on, it was a good study, multi-center, thousands, 3,000 plus students involved. They had three outcome measures. One of them was a modeling test of common objectives, those objectives that were being taught. There was no difference. The p-value was 0.99, which can't get much worse. I mean, there was no difference. They had another outcome measure, which was modeling test to problem solving and reasoning. There was no difference. P equals 9, 0.902. Their last modeling um, outcome was, or, I'm sorry, their last outcome was modeling of, uh, of student scores in something called ITED 16, which was a broader, no difference, 0.346. The com in the, bo the back of the article, at the bottom of the article, when in the discussion, the authors of the article actually say that Common Core State Standards of Mathematics takes a neutral position whether to organize the high school mathematics curriculum into traditional or integrated pathways. Yes. And the content's the same. If you look at the no, Common no, but Core I'm saying frameworks. In terms of, because I mean, I think we have two, two questions that are being mixed in here. One is the honors and heterogeneous grouping. That's a, that's a question I think is a, there's research that indicates both models can work. You also have to work in gifted and talented and whether you're going to do cluster grouping or other models that serve that population. The other is just, you know, from a math teacher's perspective, do you do traditional sequencing, right. do you do integrated math? Right. And again, at least from the article that, you know, I was provided that's a really good study, it's not a slam dunk at this point as to which one is most successful in terms of promoting achievement. And I'm just wondering, if it isn't a slam dunk, why the rush to implement it while we still are in this sort of embryonic stage at the middle school level? because our textbooks are 10 years old and don't cover the content that's under Common Core. And I think part of the challenge that JFK has been facing is that they've been taking a curriculum that's not aligned with Common Core and trying to supplement with these other resources. And we started that process at the high school this year. We have no choice but to rewrite our algebra, all of our curriculum, but we started with looking at the Algebra 1 curriculum um, because it has to be aligned with Common Core. Um, and our existing resources don't cover enough of that content. And so what we were looking at is if the opportunity is available to purchase books that are explicitly aligned with Common Core, why would we not take advantage of that opportunity? Because otherwise we'd be asking the city of Northampton to pay for professional development and release time for us to do the work of aligning our existing curriculum with the Common Core standards, accessing whatever additional resources we can find, and then somewhere down the road when we purchase a new curriculum, paying again for the professional development and the, and the, the release time to do that. And it strikes me as not responsible to ask the city of Northampton to pay for us to rewrite curriculum two times in close succession. It would be, if the funds are available, it strikes me as crazy to not take advantage of it. Uh, our books are inadequate um, and, and not very good uh, in the opinion of most of us who use them. We would like new textbooks um, and, and we're excited to get new textbooks and in looking at the options that were out there, we decided unanimously that what we wanted was to adopt an integrated curriculum, that in the curricula that we were looking at, the integrated ones were, were more appealing and more rigorous. My suggestion would be that you fix as a, as a math department, again, I'm not saying JFK versus time school, as a math department that you address the issues that the beginning part of your sequence before jumping to, that would, and again, you know, when you say the new textbooks will come in, um, one of the interesting things in the, in the study was that fidelity to curriculum was not predictive of success. So. <laughs> sure, but having textbooks that are explicitly not in alignment with the standards that we're supposed to be teaching makes it challenging for especially a novice teacher. And we've had a lot of turnover in our math department. We had to replace a third of our teachers. And having incoming math teachers, having to give them books that are not aligned with the standards and explain to them, well, here's how we resequence it, and then we add this unit here, and then we created this other unit there, that's extraordinarily challenging for a new teacher. So it, to be able to have a, a coherent curriculum that's explicitly in 
in alignment with the state standards is a much easier thing to give to an incoming teacher than this sort of you know pieced together thing. Um, I, I want to do what's in the best interest of our students. Yeah. I want them to be prepared for park if we end up if the state ends up voting that that's what we're going to do in place of the MCAS. And I'm deeply concerned <coughs> about being able to prepare them given our existing resources. The books we have are just out of date. The superintendent wanted to add something at this point? I would. You know, it's very interesting to listen to this sort of discussion because obviously I wasn't here two years ago. Um, I do understand where the parents are coming from. And I also want to say that I feel strongly that you've done your best to be um, as diplomatic as possible in talking about the shortcomings of what you see at JFK with regard to mathematics. And I appreciate the fact that you have not singled out teachers. In fact, you've been very uh, appreciative of the efforts of the teachers. Uh, from my understanding, there have been some challenges at JFK, one of them being the fact that there have been turnover in the math department. And specifically in eighth grade this year, we have a new teacher. And we have also had one who left halfway through the year with a new one coming in. I'm not sure what promises were made with regard to professional development for diversified instruction. Um, I think that there has been uh, an effort with regard to the staff and the administration at JFK to follow through on that. I think they have been hampered for lack of leadership and for lack of money in order to do it. I'm pleased to hear that they're looking, uh, and I knew that they were looking at also changing their um, curriculum. Um, because that's not, the current one is not one that um, I'm very fond of either. But I think that a couple of things have changed. First of all, I'm very sorry that no one told me um, that there was an issue in this area. I've been here since July 22nd. And until we started talking about the math curriculum at the high school changes, I heard nothing about anything happening at JFK. Uh, in fact, I know that after this was instituted, the school committee asked last year that JFK come and report on the progress, and I believe JFK did that. Um, the board, I think, asked good questions at that time and seemed satisfied with what was happening, and I don't think any parents made any judgments with regard to that. So I know that this is really a surprise to me as the um, superintendent currently, and I also think it's a, a surprise to um, Principal Wilson. Um, so I'm sorry that no one felt they could talk to, to us sooner than now. What I have done since I've heard about this is to um, look at our resources and to work with the uh, math department chair, the administrators, um, and with our new director of curriculum and assessment in terms of where can we find the money um, both in terms of buying the new textbooks necessary at JFK and at the high school, and also how do we do uh, a better job or a more in-depth job of diversified um, and working with differentiated instruction. Uh, I've been able to do that. If I'd known it sooner, I would have done it sooner. We have some plans to do more of that work before this school year is out. We have plans to also have summer courses available uh, which our teachers will be taking this summer. And at this point, I'm concentrating only in math and English. That's not to say that as we go through this, more of the departments and more of the teachers will be involved in it. Um, and also moving into the next school year. Um, the gentleman who talked about the fact that you need a coach in every room, it would be ideal. I don't know and I don't come from school systems that's had that luxury. But I think you can do a good program uh, with some help from outside people and with help from inside people. Because we have people within our faculty who do a tremendous job <coughs> of diversified uh, and differentiated instruction. Those people, I think we can also help, have them help other teachers in our district. And it's also a good learning process for people to learn from their peer group. So I think that we have been able to put in place a plan that will help the progress both at the high school and at JFK. I'm sorry that you feel that things have not gone well this year. I think that there have been some extenuating circumstances. I think that we have a plan in place that will make this a better situation in the upcoming year. Um, the honors courses are still in place for next year, and I think the discussion needs to continue. 
uh, you'll have a new superintendent at that point with regard to what happens with honors for a year after next. But I want to assure you that I do understand your frustrations um, and I think that we have place, things in place to help with that. I think you have a terrific faculty here and terrific administrators. When we don't hear until it's a crisis situation, it's hard for us to do something about it um, in advance. But once I do know that there's a situation that needs to be corrected, I don't have any problems with putting things in motion to correct it. And I believe that I've done that with the cooperation of the people here tonight. And I can't tell you how proud I am of the efforts that your faculty members, and at this point I'm talking uh, mathematics, have put into the research they've done and the work they've done to come up with something that is in the best interest of children. Um, that's what we all want. Common sense says we don't want to dumb down a curriculum. We don't want students learning less. We want them learning more. And we want more students learning more, not less. We don't want to stifle kids who have natural abilities uh, in any of these subject areas. We want to be able to have those children also learn to the maximum ability that they have. And that's our goal and that's the commitment that I've made, these people have made, and I'm sure the school committee also wants to make. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bennett, did you? You're all set? Uh, Back to Mr. I just want to you know, recognize that um, Ms. Stavely held does this over and above her teaching responsibilities and the amount of time that she spends considering these transitions um, is considerable and I'm, I'm glad you know again I'm not trying to say that moving to integrated mathematics is a mistake because I think that there are many countries there are many systems that employ it successfully I think if it's the considered judgment of the math faculty at NHS that that's the right choice and that resources are available to do it I think it should happen on the separate question of how to do differentiation effectively and heterogeneous classrooms, I would, I guess, two things. One, I'd like to hear about that well in advance of when the public hears about it. So, so that the school committee could be informed of that process before it's rolled out to the parents. That would be, I think, a fantastic opportunity for you know, us to hear about it and then inform our constituents. Um, the other thing is in terms of the current situation with placement, again, I think it's our responsibility as a, as a school committee to, because we have continuity as an institution, somewhat, uh, at least it's here for <laughs> another two decades, that, that we're informed by the math department, and again, I mean, right now, this has been great cooperation, six through 12, on where are we with JFK in terms of outcomes, right? We always want to talk about data, even though it, you know, it, it becomes trite and sometimes just a, something to cover up real inquiry. Um, but if we can get the data of, we have baseline data of how many students were making it to honors geometry, geometry in ninth grade. We know that because we did it for a long time. If, if you could come back to us when you have the information on where students have been placed, I think that is, we, we need to have that as a school committee. Absolutely. In order, in order to, again, inform our constituents with about whether the transition has been successful, and if not, we need to hear what corrective actions are going to be taken. Absolutely. Well, test is in, in the school year June? Yeah, the eighth grade math assessment or will be at I the think, end of the year. And, I think, and Do you want to come up to the podium, Ms. Uh, Ms. Principal? pathway was that kids were going to get a or students were going to get a deeper understanding of the math content still have the opportunity to get as far as they did prior to the math change so that we would not see as many students moving to honors geometry and we would see more students having the opportunity to accelerate and it's not that we don't want more students to to accelerate we want more students to have a deeper understanding of the curriculum and and so i need to just kind of revisit that as the intent of the new math pathway in eighth grade right yeah the, the idea was that we wanted students having that stronger foundation because we were seeing those of us who teach the, the upper level math classes that unfortunately some of the students who had been through that accelerated pathway um here 
they were great with procedural knowledge. They, they could memorize algorithms really well, and they could calculate really well, and they could do algebraic operations really well. But when you would give them a novel problem, a lot of the kids would freeze up. They, they weren't comfortable doing real deeper problem solving. And so we identified that as being something that we needed to address. Um, and that was part of the motivation for the change made at JFK. Um, differentiation is really challenging. It, doing differentiated instruction well, there's no question, takes a lot of training. And, um, and I'm pleased uh, that Superintendent Nash is, is making a commitment to helping the, the faculty at both JFK and at NHS, you know, build on their differentiation skills as, as, as much as possible um, for any classes that either of our two buildings offer to heterogeneous groupings. Um, I know that Brian and I have talked about uh, that for the first round of teachers uh, teaching integrated one at the high school, we would want to form a professional learning committee where they're meeting once a week and collaborating on assessment and on lesson plans um, and talking about the differentiated strategies that they're using. We take this very seriously. If we're you know, going to do it, I, I want to do it properly. Um, and and I, I feel heartened by the fact that our faculty at the high school is enthusiastic about switching to an integrated yeah. curriculum. And I would also say at the high school level, our, our faculty is very um, invested in different, differentiated instruction. This year we already have a, um, an ongoing professional learning community that meets once a, book, um, once a week to follow a book. Uh, one of our school psychologists is leading that and we have, we have about 20 active teachers in that that meet weekly uh, talking about differentiated instruction. They bring lessons, they dissect lessons. So this is not something new. Um, it is part of what we strive to do. And can we get better? Absolutely. But this is teachers creating their own stuff on their own time to um, meet the need. And again, differentiated instruction is, is a very common thing. Um, if you remember um, about Eight years ago, we moved away from honors biology, and that was a differentiated instruction across, and we have not had any con uh, concerns or issues. Our biology scores continue, um, you know, to be very, um, be very um, high. So I think that, you know, it is a common thing at the high school we're very proud of, and we continue with differentiated instruction. Mr. Ball? My concerns is um, maybe similar to Downey's as far as, um, this is my second term here, and at the beginning of this, we, we did an awful lot in the comprehensive math program, the CMP, and, and changing it from one program to another program. And we were assured that um, the results would be positive, that the, <coughs> the kids would go up, they'd have lots of opportunity. It would actually open more opportunity for a lot of people. And now, what happened to CMP? I mean, is it just gone? Are we replacing it? Are we going? And then again, to Downey's question, are we, or what he was seems to be saying is, are we doing it at the high school level? Then what's happening down in the eighth, seventh, and eighth grade? I mean, are we changing that to investigative math now after going through and being assured that CMP was the way to go? And that's where I fall into it. Um, it's just being a little bit leery to go ahead again. And also, I just wonder about the logistics of are there kids falling in the cracks while we're saying, no, not there, no CMP, now we're going to do this? Or, I mean, because we weren't ever told that CMP wasn't working. Well, I think the problem started when they began aligning their curriculum explicitly with Common Core. That it, when CMP was first adopted, that was previous, uh, prior to Common Core being rolled right. out. So the CMP curriculum was in place when the Common Core frameworks were released. And that's when they started looking at it and realizing that CMP was not going to cover all of the content um, in the Common Core standards. Right. Okay, so it's, it's so, it, so, so up until then, we thought it was working but then found that we have to align to the Common Core, and so because of that, we had to yes. change it. Okay, I understand that, thank you. And I think that's been part of the problem as far as differentiation goes, is that teachers are working with a curriculum that's not explicitly aligned with the standards, and so they are having to utilize other resources and, you know, we've on the vertical team we've we've used the, the word Frankenstein curriculum because right. we have to cut and paste and stick things together because we don't have textbooks that are explicitly aligned with the standards that we're now trying to teach to. Right. And, and we've received a, a lot of research that does state that the, state that integrated um, instruction does work. But I'm concerned at, at when we're how we're going to find out if it's not working just because it it just doesn't feel straightforward and up that this wasn't working and this is what we're doing. Maybe it's the last minute notice. Maybe it's, you know, this emergency. Now we have to do this. Maybe it's us not knowing before the public knows. I mean, maybe it's all of those things. But I just know that we put an awful lot into the CMP and there were an awful lot of, um, you know, parents that we said, okay, this is going to happen. And it feels like, and I'm not sure, but some of those parents said this didn't happen. And I'm just wondering, you know, I mean, what, what's going to prevent people from getting lost in the transition? 
Um, you know, because if it was my student that just happened to be in that odd year, I wouldn't be happy. And, and so one of the things about the CMP curriculum is, as Rachel said, it's not core aligned at this point. So our math teachers spent a lot of time this summer aligning um, to the common core and identifying uh, supplemental resources to be able to teach to the Massachusetts frameworks in the common core. Um, I do think that there are strengths with CMP. I also know that we're doing a lot of research. Our math team at the middle school is doing a lot of research around the gaps that they feel that CMP has for our students, for all of our students, and trying to identify a math program and math curriculum that will meet the needs of all the students. Uh, some of the things that we're looking at are um, programs that have some basic skill, um, built, you know, skill work built into it, um, enhancements and enrichment. There's an online um, part uh, of the program that we're looking at. And I think one of the things that we've felt all along with CMP is it really doesn't um, work as much as we would like on the basic skill development um, of the math concepts that our students need to be success successful math students and successful at the high school. So what happened to those kids? What happened to the kids that got it rolled out in what, what grade? Seventh grade was the first? Eighth grade now? Where are they? It's this year's eighth graders. Eight, they're eight, okay. For the new the pathway. But CMP has so, been in use uh, for 12 years in the district. Okay, but so is it, going to, is it going to be difficult for those kids to transition and to stay where they're going to be? I mean, from, from the new, because we changed it a couple of years ago. We changed and added in something that we call CMP, whether it was being used for 12 years or not. That's when we said we were going to be adding. I'm just wondering um, what happened to those kids that learned differently and now where are they going to be with this new investigative math? And back to the second part of my first question is are we losing some of the kids in the transition years? I mean, are some of the kids just going to kind of be like, well, sorry, but luck didn't have it your way and next year it would be good and last year it was good, but this is not a good year for you. So, you know, I mean, what do we do with, are there kids getting lost? Would it be my daughter if she was in one of these grades? Well, it's just the one transition year. It's, it's this year's eighth graders are the, the, the first class to go through the new heterogeneous progression at JFK. Um, I, I think looking at this year's eighth grade math assessment is going to give us a good sense of how that goes. It's the assessment that we pilot, it piloted last year, so we have last year's data to compare to. Um, so I mean, I think that's where the proof is going to be. I, I believe that Tim has been working on some benchmark assessments, and mm -hmm. it's possible we could get data from those to, to make a comparison to. But um, the intention is very much that completion of the 6 through 8 curriculum here prepares students to start at our foundational level courses. And students who are very high achieving math students, that will show up on the 8th grade assessment. And then they could begin in geometry or honors geometry. And, and again, Blue, um, the curriculum of Algebra 1A, 1B is part of the integrated, so, so we're not taking that out. It's just in a, different se it's a, it's in a different sequence. Right, but is that, and, and with it being in a different sequence, is it going to affect some of the kids adversely? I don't see how the resequencing of topics would make any difference. Uh, uh, and I would say also, and then Mr. a lot of the curriculums, you know, you've heard about this, you know, the Frankenstein, you know, the fact that we don't have uh, materials to help us before we're teaching. Um, the curriculums that we're looking at also come embedded with a variety of differential instruction things to help with the multi-levels there. Right. I mean, right now, as well as we don't have component. that. So part of the problem is we have a variety of teachers, you know, cutting and pacing various mm -hmm. things. To have c consistency across the board in classrooms is very hard. But if you buy a curriculum that, that is straightforward, that offers for every teacher, you know, standards of differential instruction, standards for, for high and low and middle, you know, you're getting a better product. And that's part of what happens when you, when you have the resources. This is an opportunity to buy, you know, a very consistent resource that will provide the tools for teachers to do what they really want to do, which is help all students. When do you think we'll be able to see the actual um, tangible effects of this? Like these kids go, wow, my kid is smart this year. I mean, is it really going to kick in now? I mean, I think I when think we see them at the high school and we see how they do in their courses. Yeah. Yeah. So next year. So it'll, you figure it'll take a year and within a year you can actually say this is working. Because right here I see that we're doing the 2014 and 2015 and then the following year we're up in the air about that. So I mean. So I, I think that we. You know, it usually takes two or three years to really gather any type of data on the success of anything, however, of a new program 
we you know we'll, we have always had a reflective process of, of looking at our own formative and summative assessment data we don't have um, real data on our seventh and eighth graders who have gone through this math pathway yet because it's too soon right. however what we do have is the expertise of our math teachers who really feel that kids have a much deeper understanding of the content um, more kids have a much deeper understanding of the content and that's evidenced in the data analysis we've been using but we don't have MCAS results for these kids yet um, I honestly feel that with the new math program that we are purchasing some of the teachers have already started to pilot it and they feel like there's a lot more rigor we've been given some samples and there's a lot more rigor um, for all the students and there's a lot more opportunity for differentiation built into the new math program that we're looking at there's different entry levels to problems and to concepts um, that is embedded right in the math program I, and I do think it's time to look at what we've been doing and and especially when it's not a Aligned, and especially looking at some of the data that we've seen in various areas on various standards um, around where the gaps are in CMP. And, and one other follow-up question is, are the teachers on board with this? I mean, the teachers that are going to have to be teaching the differenti differentiated instruction, are they pretty much on board with this? High school? Or, well, at the high school, or let's say if you're teaching an honors geometry or an yeah. honors this, it, it would seem easier to teach one honors than to teach a differentiated class how are the teachers as far as are they on board with this I mean where's this we voted unanimously to adopt an integrated curriculum uh, and and at no mm -hmm. point did we say that that was going to include uh, getting rid of leveling um, we have not <laughs> said that we we're going to get rid of, of, of honors level classes um, the question is just until we decide which curriculum we're going with we're not sure what that honors option would look like through the integrated pathway uh, it just depends on which curriculum we purchase because the the sequencing of the topics is slightly different and so whether it would be that a student coming out of eighth grade could start an integrated two or whether it would be that there was a compacted pathway through the three semesters worth of work or whether they would still complete three semesters of work but at an honors level course we haven't made that determination yet and that's going to depend on which curriculum we purchase and and we're of course going to you know have a rigorous discussion around that that's not a decision that we want to enter into rashly we want to make sure that the honors or accelerated option is one that's that's going Going to be sound and serve the best interests of our students. You know, and, and I, I would say that, you know, at the high school level, so all of our honors and AP level classes, sophomore years and above, anyone can take those. So there's a lot of differentiating going on. And differentiating is providing access to the information. So I think there needs to be some clarity of leveling versus differentiating instruction. You could have a student that has an IEP of 504 in an AP or honors class, and that teacher will have to differentiate how to provide access to that information. And that is happening across the board. So I think, again, differentiate instruction is one thing, leveling is a totally different. Right. Okay. Um, and, oh. I was just going to add one more thing about uh, the adding additional <coughs> honors courses. Part of what we like about compacting through to a three semester core. Uh, uh, Core progression is that it opens up opportunity for us to offer more advanced level classes than we're offering we're frustrated that the highest level that we offer is Calc AB we want to offer Calc BC we want to offer discrete math these are courses that we'd like to open up to our students and the adoption of a three semester core progression frees us up to do that I, I um, recognize Miss Hennessy and go to Mr. Shelfo and then so Mr. Moore the question was answered just three quick points. I'm glad you added the additional math courses at the end of that because I think that's a real important part of this. And I think you guys are doing great work. The thing I think where people are getting confused about, and I think it's in the middle school, um, when I, I hear some confusing things, I'm new to the school committee, so I'm going to ask everyone's forgiveness if I don't know some stuff. But when I look at Northampton schools, I look at your AP scores, and I'm totally impressed. I'm impressed with the number of students who could take math courses at Smith. I'm impressed with how many students go to MIT. Like, and yet, when I read this, it's confusing to me that, um, that one of the reasons <clears throat> this model in middle school you changed was the understanding that students who, um, I'm sorry, um, because of the gaps in math understanding of the accelerated students. That doesn't make sense to me. 
So what used to happen is that when students would take the placement test at the end of sixth grade, yeah. in seventh grade, they would cover all of the content in the seventh and eighth grade curriculum compacted into one year. And then in eighth grade, they did the equivalent of the Algebra One course at NHS and then started at NHS in geometry, honors, geometry, and then went on to Algebra Two, honors, Algebra Two, pre-calc, yeah. honors, pre-calc, yeah. and then calculus. And what those of us who taught the higher level classes were seeing is that a lot of the kids who had been through that accelerated pathway were strong algorithmically, they were strong procedurally, they were less strong conceptually. And the fear was that it was the acceleration of that compacting of two years of math into one year that was leaving them with gaps in their understanding. It, it's still a little confusing, but I understand your point. And the second part is that I get that you have more students who are mastering these concepts. I think that's great. My concern is that that level of kids who need that challenge, who are bored. I don't want kids bored in a math class. None right. of us so that's, <laughs> that, so that's where I do think I agree right. with that. We need to look at the data, because that's very, very mm -hmm. concerning to me. I'm glad that they're mastering it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's that other level that I want to make sure we're getting. Oh, and we, we understand that, and our teachers are working extremely hard to implement mm -hmm. the new pathway. And they are, you know, they have taken release time, worked over the summer, um, really trying to coordinate their efforts on instruction. Um, they've done a lot of professional development and um, worked together with the high school with the vertical math team. So nobody wants s students' needs not to be met. Um, I, I also really feel like um, these conversations that kind of started in public, like Regina said, I would really like to have heard some of this prior to the rolling out of the new math pathway at the high school before um, I really learned from, you know, more than, I think I've been talked to by one parent about English. Um, so these are things that we always address. If there are concerns or issues with anything that we're doing, of course we want to address these things and make a plan together with the teachers and with the parents and the students to make sure everybody's getting what they need. Um, you know, and, and so that has been a strength at JFK, I think, and I just feel like this is, um, you know, something that we could certainly address and certainly would want to address and that the teachers are really focusing on trying to meet the needs of all the learners. And I, and I also think that the understanding of the curriculum that we are teaching currently that has come to us from the high school, the 1A minus curriculum, so we're doing a combination of the eighth grade curriculum and some of the 1A, min 1A from the high school is the curriculum that was intended to be taught at the middle school in eighth grade. And yes, we, in the transition year, wanted to support students who wanted more and people who had an understanding of what the old pathway was and what the old possibilities were. Um, that's, we've moved away from the old, path, the old sequence of teaching at JFK and you know, in combination with the high school in our collaboration, this is the decision that we made. But we also want to make sure kids are challenged and we want this transition year of kids to have the opportunity to accelerate through the program mm -hmm. if they're able to do that, certainly. Mr. Shelfa. Uh, my question is for the superintendent. I wonder if you could just clarify for me and anybody else who might benefit, what is the school committee's role when it comes to curricular initiatives and decisions like being talked about. Sure. The um, school committee's role is certainly to be knowledgeable of, to have information presented to them, but in terms of curriculum areas, it's really the um, decision of the superintendent as to changes in curriculum, uh, resequencing courses, etc. Where the school committee does need to vote are things that change the graduation requirements and things of that nature. Um, I would also say that, for instance, if we were going to become an in innovation school at Leeds, for instance, that would certainly take school committee approval. If we were going to do um, Spanish immersion uh, as a school at Bridge Street, that would take school approval. Um, so it's, it's a difference of the level of the change that requires a school committee approval versus things of this nature, which is really in the purview of the educators um, and the superintendent. So are there other comments or questions um, for the folks who are here this evening? I just want to say one thing. I want to thank you very much for the time that you put into it. And I do know that an, um, an awful lot of teachers put an awful lot in that's outside of the purview of what they're being paid for and, and their job. And, and I just want to say thank you very much for, for all that you do. So 
I'm sure you do want the best interest of the students and success. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, mm. does that com uh, does that complete the report of the curriculum committee? Okay, <laughs> so I just wanted to job. verify that. You got away with that, huh? So we'll now move to the superintendent report and. Uh, Right. Superintendent Nash? Yes, um, it's been spoken to a couple times already, but with regard to the park pilot testing, um, as you know from your last committee meeting, um, I had your approval to write to the commissioner to see if we could request some help um, because we were feeling overwhelmed in terms of the amount of testing that we had to do. There were five schools, six different tests, etc. So I did write such a letter and I was pleasantly surprised. Um, that there was a, a lot of cooperation on the part of DESE, Department of Education, in terms of helping us with that dilemma. Um, what it came down to is that we're going to be able to offer um, only two testing sites and two tests, uh, one now and one at the end of the year. And what that will mean is that our Director of Technology and our Director of uh, Curriculum and Assessment will be able to work in one school at a time, uh, which will be an awful lot easier. Both of these will be computerized tests. Uh, one will be the fifth grade at Jackson Street, two sections, and one will be the sixth grade at um, JFK uh, at the end of the year, and that will be um, uh, ELA as well. So I was, I talked again with the administrators, and uh, we feel that this is doable. Um, and more importantly, our technology person feels it's doable uh, and we're set to go. I think it's sort of the best of both possible worlds because it still gives us an opportunity to see some of the questions that will be on the park testing. And it will also provide students, some students, with an opportunity to do computerized testing, which I think will set us up in terms of knowing where the problems are uh, when eventually uh, we end up doing um, park or something similar because there will be something to replace the MCAS. So I think it's worked very well, and I um, thank the um, people who worked with us at the DESE very much um, for understanding our particular circumstances. Uh, I do want to emphasize this was not, um, at least from my perspective, a vote against PARC or a vote against anything. It was trying to um, make the department aware of the circumstances we had in Northampton this year, uh, which made our being able to do all of these things they wanted to do, almost an impossibility. So uh, I was very thankful that they helped us out with that. Um, I might also add that I am receiving some requests to have students opt out, um, particularly at the fifth grade level. That's the one that's here immediately. Um, and I'm honoring those requests. Uh, this is pilot testing. I do not see that it's anything other than that. And I'm being very respectful of students um, and their families who wish to have them opted out. Uh, I'm not sure how that's playing out across the state. I think there's some perhaps um, people who are more versed in the law than I am as to whether that's something that they can do or can't do. I don't care. I'm just saying if parents really want to do that, then I'm going to respect their positions on that. And uh, principals will find something for the children to do during that time. Um, I'm not sure if all of you received the, um, the bright yellow conference um, paper from Stan Rosenberg. Um, Senator Rosenberg every year offers a municipal conference. It's local. It's right here in the Clarion. I think I've made it uh, nine out of the last ten years. And uh, I would encourage you to go to that. Now I'm seeing some blank faces. We did, didn't get it. You did not get it. I will see that you get it. You got it, Lisa? I didn't get it. Okay. I'll see that everyone gets it. If you have it, it's a second what copy. The date. The date. The date is going to be on um, just a sec. April Saturday, April 12th. It's usually all morning. Uh, and this year, I would encourage you to go because um, Senator um, Elizabeth Warner is going to be the keynote speaker. And there are some um, individual. Um, workshops as well. Usually there's one in education. There isn't this year. But I'm sure they're all good workshops. You can find something of interest, hopefully. And if you have the time on Saturday morning, it's usually about 8.30 and you get out about 2. There's a nice luncheon. It's free. And uh, it's also a nice way to show our support for the work that uh, Senator Rosenberg does for us. 
So I would encourage you to go. I will send you this. You need to fill it out and get it back as soon as you can because it is a limited number of people and it's always filled. It's for municipal uh, people. Okay. Um, thirdly, um, please do not forget we have a school committee workshop next Wednesday night. It's with uh, Regina Tate, who's legal counsel and she's going to um, talk with and answer questions and work with the school committee with regard to roles and responsibilities of school committee and superintendents. So I think it's a very important one. Uh, you will not be bored. Uh, it's always a lively discussion and she does a great job working with school committee, probably because she used to be one. And that's all I have on my report. What time is that meeting at, just to double check in my calendar? That meeting <coughs> is? 7.30. 7.30. Okay, that seemed late. I had it at 7.30, it just seemed late, so I just wanted to <coughs> check. It is a little later, and that was to accommodate um, someone. I forgot cool. who it is. <laughs> okay, are yeah. you all set? With I'm the, set. Okay, um, so that completes the superintendent report. Uh, we now um, will move to a report or an update from the Budget and Property Subcommittee, uh, and I'll turn the floor over to uh, School Committee Member Downey Meyer. Okay. So first I'll just, reading from the minutes, recap what happened. We were presented with the final report of the initial plan and modified plan, 2014-15 route preparation for Northampton Public Schools. We previously voted to fund an effort by Tyler Technologies to cost out the hub system that um, Mr. Moore had <coughs> first proposed and had been discussed previously at school committee meetings. Um, after a presentation by our transportation supervisor, Joy Winnie, of this report and consideration of cost of the different proposals uh, that was also prepared by Ms. Winnie, we voted to not recommend adopting the hub transportation system. Um, we were unanimous in feeling that the additional cost, and the additional cost would be for all current pass holders, $684,000 versus $600,000 for a current transportation system, that taking into account what we anticipate in additional appropriation, subtracting what will be absorbed by what we've already contractually obligated ourselves to as far as um, step raises, space adjustment, lane changes, that there was not sufficient money in this year's budget to absorb the $84,000 additional. Um, two of us, with Mr. Moore dissenting, um, believed also a, a considerable difficulty with the hub plan was that it would have required changing the start time at all three levels of the school system. And that um, when we have approached this before, um, we have always talked about giving the community enough time to consider the effect of a change and that here again we had been talking about a high school change and um, this, would, this would require every family that had um, a student in the schools and as well as every employee to potentially make a change in their, in their lives which, which might be difficult. Um, what we were left with as some questions. Um, first, we as a school committee need to think about whether we need and desire to continue funding transportation at the high school level. Um, currently, to our knowledge, there are no high schools that have discontinued this. The other consideration is that if uh, you look at the data that we've been provided on busing, we currently run five high school buses. Five times 55 gives you a capacity of 275 students who could sit on those buses. We issue 239 passes. Um, we were provided with limited data that was collected um, this fall. And if, if you go back, it should be in your email or your packet. Um, we had roughly 100 to 120 students riding on those buses that have 275 seats. That's a 35% rate of filling those seats. You wouldn't run an airline that way. Um, however, we need to be sure that every student has a seat if they decide to ride. Um, it may be possible that we as a school committee would accept a design of a transportation system that would not provide 239 seats every day. But if we collected data that showed us over 180 days that the peak ridership on any particular day was 170, we might decide to cut the buses that we didn't need. Um, however, before going forward to collect this data, 
we thought it was important for the school committee to weigh in. It wouldn't make sense for us to collect data if you all, even if we collected data that said there were only 150 riders in 180 days, were not ready to make that commitment to redesigning the transportation system so we didn't have excess capacity that was not used over the study period. So throw it open to discussion and comment. Um, and of course, this is only our recommendation if the school committee did wish to put the $84,000 um, additional money in and move forward with adjusting the other start times, that certainly is, is the committee's choice. Are there any questions or comments about the, uh, about the report, Mr. Mr. Yeah, I'd like to explain my uh, dissenting vote. <laughs> um, you know, I, right now, I just I think a big part of, from my perspective in terms of looking at what I think is, 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 it is clearly an issue if you change the schedule that will cause problems, but I think from my perspective, the, the, the current schedule has a lot of problems. I mean, we, we already know that um, our start times are detrimental to our teenagers, and in fact, a couple of months ago, we got a letter from our administrative leadership team pointing out that our start time for elementary students is, um, I think the quote was, uh, developmentally inappropriate. Um, so for all of our levels, we are wrong in terms of when we start school. And then couple that with a transportation system that is essentially, for financial reasons, um, pretty darned inefficient. Um, Donnie just went over sort of our utilization of, of seats, which we have, a, we drive a lot of buses around. The high schools are particularly egregious, but if you look at those numbers, um, at JFK and the middle school, we're still roughly two-thirds full, um, which is, again, a lot of empty seats compared to what we're paying for. Um, and on top of that, they run late. So every morning, we have kids missing breakfast and instructional time. And every afternoon, we have teachers who have work to do in their classrooms who are standing outside waiting for the bus to come. Um, so, so our current system is, while you know, we're all used to it, has a lot of a lot of flaws, a lot of little pockets of mediocrity, and um, again, you know, the fact that they run late is, is nobody's fault. That's that's because of the budget. We reduce bu buses as far as we can, but still, having reduced buses as far as we can in terms of route length, we still end up with excess capacity, which really was to gets me to the next thing, which is the, um, the hub system, which is really the, the genesis of the hub system. Was you have this excess capacity that um, you say, well, do we have people to put in those seats? And the answer is yes, we do. We have high school students to put in those seats. Um, and interestingly, what, what, what this report from Tyler did, we, if you look at it, we got, um, it had two, it made two plans. The first plan was if we provided a, a seat for every single student in Northampton who is eligible to purchase a pass. That's well more than the number of people who actually purchase passes, and I don't think we really expect every student to. So we, we paid Tyler Technology to provide a plan, a transportation plan, um, for a group of people who we don't expect to ever be transporting. Um, that's plan A. So there's no real need to pay attention to that because it doesn't tell us much that we want to know. The plan B, um, you know, if, if you just add up, it basically provides a plan for every single pass that we issue. And that gets to the question Donnie was asking about. The question I think we need to have an answer to from the school committee is whether or not we would want to have a um, transportation plan that was geared towards our actual ridership, similar to what we do in you know, all sorts of other places in the world. Um, you know, closer to actual ridership, obviously you need to leave a buffer so that you Ways can provide rides for everybody who's there, um, but not one that's pegged to the actual number of passes. Because we really didn't need Tyler Technology to tell us that if we added up the total number of passes at the high school and the total number of passes at um, JFK, that that then divided by, say, 50 would give us more than nine buses. We already knew that. We did not need to do that at all. Um, if, on the other hand, you look at the numbers we have at JFK, um, 
So, so what that plan does, it's interesting because you can learn some things from it, though, nonetheless. From plan B, what you learn is that it averages out to about 40 passes per bus, which you say, well, why would they have to do that? And the answer is because that's the average. And when you build routes, you know, some routes are going to be full and other routes are going to be much less full just because of the way, you know, you have to build bus routes. So the average is 40 passes per bus, and that's why we have, that's why it takes um, 12 buses. But that tells you something in terms of then what the range is on the average, because you know if the average is 40, you know that some of them are 10 more than the average, and no more than that because that's how, what it's based on. If you look at um, the JFK high school combined utilization rate, it's 65% off of this data. All right. So essentially, if you take the roughly 500 passes that would be getting on the bus at JFK with high school and JFK students, and being taken home, those 500 passes, and you divide them amongst the nine Durham buses, you get 38, you get 58 passes per bus. And these are buses that are, if you have two children to a seat, are roughly 51 capacity. Remember, we, the buses are 77 capacity if you have three to a seat. Um, and that's what we use as a benchmark for elementary students. Um, sixth graders at JFK are just about as wide as fifth graders at all the elementary schools. So, so really, when you do, if you say if you say 50 as your number, that's actually a conservative number. You could you could fit more middle school students on a bus. It's a conservative number. Um, if you say so, if you say 50 on the, you know, 58 passes per bus. And then you multiply it times our utilization rate of 65%, you get 38 riders per bus, which is, by my math, 12 less than 50. And if you look, remember what, you know, what the proposal was on the plan B, that when you, that they were 10 under, they were at 40 passes per bus in order to be able to get 50 on the, on the fuller routes, right? So again, this gets you at 38 average, which would put you at, you do the thing, about 48 or so on the fuller buses. The question, there's a couple of questions there, obviously. Some days you can have more. Yes. Um, this would be happening right here, just outside here at the big bus loop in front of JFK. Um, you'd, it's happening here. You would be, you know, wouldn't be like, catch as catch thing, you, you, you're happening right here. And if the, the rule is basically that kids can sit on a bus, as many as on a bench as you can fit, <laughs> the, as long as they don't exceed the boundary of the seat. In other words, you can't be hanging out in the aisle. Um, so it's basically three. Because those are, honest to goodness, those are 12 inch, no, 12 and a half. 13 inch. Those are 13 inch spaces because they're 39 inch benches. So, but it's true, you know, kids are really that big, these little kids. And um, so it would be possible if you had a few more to do it and they would be that crowded for the first five minutes of the route until the first kids got off at the first stop. The other thing to think about is that's with the nine buses, the existing nine buses. The other thing is if you look at the, the, this sheet, um, basically, by eliminating the tier, we have a lower cost than we do currently. That's the bottom row, or the row above. Um, the additional cost for hub busing, this is using the plan B in here, providing, providing a seat for every single pass, um, was three more buses, in which they all cost a little less than $50,000 a piece for a total of 144000 but which when you add it into the lower cost of eliminating, you subtract the, what you gain from eliminating the tier, you end up with a net gain of about um, 80000 So it costs about 80000 
what that means is though that if rather than doing it on 10 buses, if you did it on, I mean on nine buses, if you did it on 10 buses, it would be a roughly break even because you're eliminating a tier that saves you 60,000, buying a bus that costs 48,000, you'll have some additional costs almost certainly on the van pool side of things with the hub. Um, but with 10 buses, then you really do get even more room. You know, on 10 buses, you're down to, you're starting with 50 passes per, and 0.65 gives you 36 riders instead of 38. And so you really have, a, a, at least in judging from the pieces of information we've gotten, and it's really too bad that we didn't get from Tyler Technology a plan of using 10 buses, using nine buses, to show us what the actual routes would look like and what it would be. I think um, that would have been a better use of Tyler Technology. But what I'm trying to get at is that from this information, it still seems as though, provided that one question that Danny posed, and I think it's a really important question because it's pretty fundamental, is whether you are comfortable having a transportation plan that essentially is based on ridership as opposed to, and it's a pretty big number, it's, it's 500 people, so you're 500 passes, so you just, you know, it'll stay pretty constant. Um, whether it's on ridership or on passes, and and at what com you know what percent sort of above you feel comfortable with, and at what point you're saying no, that's cutting it too close. We couldn't do that, um, but it still leaves it as a possibility. The hub plan, and again, the virtues of it are because, you know, I don't know what our budget's going to look like in a couple of weeks, but when we're looking at needing to save some, maybe looking at needing to save some money. Um, and then back to, remember, the original drawbacks of our current plan. Our buses run late, they're inefficient, and, and every one of our levels of school starts at a time that the research says is the wrong time, which is a remarkably, you know, <laughs> compelling argument for me. Mr. Ball and then Mr. Shapo. Okay. Uh, I understand the idea of the hub, and I understand that it may actually be a good idea, except we're dealing with a different issue. Um, also, not only the hub, but also the start time, and that being a social change and have a social effect to the community. Um, as far as um, how many people are on a bus, I know how many people fit on a bus. I just went on a bus trip just the other day, and because of um, I believe it was an administrative problem, but I'm not real sure. Um, we lost a bus. We had five buses that we were supposed to go on a field trip with, and we only ended up with four buses on the way there. And we didn't stop the field trip. We still had people sitting in a bu uh, in, on the seats, and there were more than two to a seat, and this was at the JFK level, and they are a little bigger than this. Some of them are this big. Some of them are that big, but they are a little bigger than this. And even the bigger ones squished with a teacher kind of fit there on the bus. My thoughts on that is it happens occasionally. If we can find the number, wherever that cutoff is, that we'll probably never hit as far as ridership goes, but we have enough compensation, enough room there, then if occasionally we do, I don't see us as leaving kids standing there just as we didn't have the whole entire sixth grade staying at JFK because we didn't have enough buses for everybody. Um, I think that we would make it work as it does, as it could. And back to the time changes, way at the beginning of the school start proposal time, there was a proposal that we had and we voted against it at the time, but I was thinking maybe we might, run, might want to reconsider it. It was basically keeping the system the way it is except for JFK moving about 15 minutes earlier and at the time that caused a, excuse me an awful lot of uproar but perhaps it wouldn't now if we look at it in terms of with the research having come out and everything else so I'm not real sure I'd like to know what happened to that because I do think that it's a lot to ask for without a lot of community input for the elementary school and JFK to change drastically <coughs> um, a few minutes is one thing but drastically I've not been for that right from the get-go. Um, we really need to talk to, um, have community input. I mean, because it, it has a social effect. Um, 
but I do wish that we would look back and see whatever happened to that, like 740 or 745 JFK starting and everything else started around and seemed to work out. And I mean, we had one that I seemed thought was kind of ideal now that we're really fudging with the numbers. So those were the two things I wanted to stay as far as that. And also the seats for per bus. I really think, I mean, if we made it work for a field trip, I think we can make it work for the occasional O, oh, and then until we adjust it and say, well, look, we, we have the figures wrong, maybe we need to adjust for more. But I don't think we need to keep the whole 270 buses, uh, bus passes if we're only you know, using 150 or 130 or whatever. Okay, Thank you. so I, I believe Mr. Shelfo is yeah. next, and then I'll go to um, Ms. Minnick. Um, I, I have a comment and a, and a question. One is that when I look at this first trans document, this is not Versatrans plan. You know, we gave them information. Mm -hmm. They ran it through their system, and they said this is what it comes out to be. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to be just the, the technology side of it gets. Mm -hmm. I just want to be clear about that. And that leads to a question of: Does uh, uh, I don't know if the, the committee knows or if the superintendent knows how many hours were used in coming up with this? I don't know. Okay. I'd be happy to find that out. I'm not sure we have the bill yet, but okay. I'll work. Because one of the, when I look at this, one of the things I was disappointed in is I don't think we gave them as much information as we could have to maybe get to some of the points mm -hmm. that you're talking about. Of course, you have to be careful with that because uh, um, you don't want to keep going back to them over and over again because that's going to that's gonna, uh, scope creep. You know, it's going to make mm -hmm. the project go bigger. <laughs> um, but I would be interested to know how many hours are left and then maybe find out from them if we could uh, sharpen our pencils, because they, they can't do it for us. We have to be clear on what it is that we're asking them to find out for us. Um, so that was my question and comment. I sent that information. Um, Howard requested it, and I did send it to him. Um, as I said, if the board votes that you really want to come up with some average for this, then that's certainly what we will do. That's not what we sent to Versatran because that's right. not that's not my position. If it's the board position, I'm happy to do it. Um, is it minute? Sorry. I think that in response to what you suggested about the plan that we voted against and might want to reconsider, uh, I suppose we could reconsider. But I think that the upshot of it was that if a 7.30 start time isn't good for high schoolers. A 7.40 start time probably isn't the best for middle schoolers. And so you'd be disadvantaging one group of people to to provide the advantage for the other group of people. Right, but the research didn't show that. The research is of the circadian rhythm shows that as they get older and having to do more at the high school age versus a sixth or a seventh grade age. So that's all. It's like, but is it like on your 14th birthday that it happens? You know, I, I mean, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is it said that adolescents have a, have a shift in the circadian rhythm, and I'm just saying that kids mature at different, a, at different mm -hmm. ages, different levels, and I think that it would be wrong to assume that because they're middle schoolers, they haven't gotten there yet, because some of them have. So I'm, that's, that's my only caution there. And as far as three to a seat, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go on measurements of their hips. <clears throat> I'm gonna go on measurements of their shoulders, which is wider in many cases. Yes, in some cases it is. You look at some of the kids, and I'm also gonna talk about musical instruments for those. <laughs> we still have instrumental music, yes. and for a few people, and backpacks and sports equipment and you know, uh, science project and everything else that kids are carrying with them on a bus. Um, I'm, I'm very cautious, and I would be extremely cautious about calculating everything based on fitting three kids to a seat. I did it, and it was sitting with your knees out into the aisle. Right. That's, why, that's why I was saying use it. You have to, you, have to you know, I think for safety purposes these days, they have to be all on the seat. That's what the roof is for. Put uh, stuff on top. <laughs> Thank you. I could check. Thank you. Um, I, I just more have a, a point of clarity that I just want to make sure I understand. So you're kind of talking about two separate things, one leading into another. So you're talking about if you reduce 
the number of actual passes given that more accurately reflects the actual riders, then that will bring the cost down or the bus routes and the amount of buses. Clearly, I'm getting something wrong. Um, well, well, there actually, well, actually, there were two discussions. One was that we do send passes when people apply for free and reduced lunches. Right. And so the question was, as a matter of policy, do we want to make that automatic or do we want to ascertain whether that student and that family that's really wants right. that pass? And because I guess that's what I was trying yeah, that's, to say. That's, so that was, that, was the f that was the first sort so of question. The superintendent just wants to interject oh, yeah. one yeah. piece there. I just want to say that it's not an automatic pass. It's if you're free and reduced, they do have to request it. Right. So it's just not automatic. But, but, I think that, but I think that the, as it's currently set up, um, it's, we're not, we're not, again, it's a resource issue, like how, how much do we pursue? Um, we have tried to make it an, an affirmative action rather than sending it recently. Um, but then the other question was, even beyond that, do we want to design a system for, as Howard said, riders and seats or passes? Right. And again, you know, you, you can't have the option of an airline of saying, here's $500 and get on the next flight. Um, you know, you do have an obligation to provide a reliable service, but I, but at least in my opinion, I don't know that that means that you always plan for 100% of passes if, if we never, ever, ever see it happen. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, how, that's how I understood what you said, yeah. really it didn't come out right. Yeah. But so then the next step after that, if, is, if the late start time is to be put in place, it will change the start times of all the schools. And what at least this, that's what it says here, right. mm -hmm. that the elementary school will be dropped off at 7.30 and that their start time will be 7.50. Middle school, 8.20 and start time, 8.35. And high school, drop off at 7.45, start at 8. That's, this is what the plan B proposed. Mm -hmm. To me, if um, elementary school students are getting dropped off at 6.30, it means some of them are being picked up before 7 o'clock in the morning. Right. Yes. And that's part of what we discussed last time, which I have a real problem with. Little kids who are six and seven years old, even with a parent, standing out for the bus at 10 of seven in the morning. Meaning they're getting up at 6.15. So yeah, we probably want our elementary school kids to start a little sooner, but do we want our really little kids out there that early? I don't. And I, and I think it diverges completely from where we were supposed to go, which is the late start time for the high school. So can I just um, just ask a quick question of the of the committee? Um, are you, so are you seeking us um, the school committee to take a some sort of an affirmative action on this this evening? Are you what are you I guess I'd like to try to just frame the discussion better for the school committee with respect to Exactly what I mean. I think that we were looking because I think you didn't. You didn't. You implied that there was an op that you that the school committee could do one thing or could do another. One of the things was the monitoring of ridership and um, to see about whether you could reduce uh, the number of buses that were needed. Or I, so. I mean, it, certainly the school committee can make it. You know, can make a decision on this hub plan tonight. Okay. Okay. It has been presented to them. It has been costed out. We don't know at this point exactly what the budget numbers are. It might be premature until after we know what the appropriation will be. So we might postpone that vote. Separate issue is we have very little data on actual ridership. So we can't even answer the question of whether or not we think we should schedule to ridership until we have that information. Um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to present it and have the committee make a reasonable judgment when they don't have data to act on. So, but again, if, you know, the superintendent had, had stated that in her view as, you know, as an experienced professional that she would not be comfortable with taking that action, taking that course. So if that judgment was shared by a majority of this committee, then I would not want to invest my time nor any else's time and gathering data that's never going to be used. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'd like to respond to that in that I think Downey may be onto something because if there is a way that you can ascertain by looking at the data every day for a year 
who's writing and who isn't writing and you can come up with a figure and you can add a fudge factor to it of 10% or whatever and you can take a bus out of operation by doing it and not extend routes that are unreasonable, then I think it might be worth looking at. How, how, um, how would, uh, do you have any sense of in the discussions you've had about how that would be accomplished? Are there, would this be some sort of an electronic monitoring or? Um, you know, you can, you can buy for tens of thousands of dollars, you can buy ridership monitoring from any number. Um, we also have the um, ability to build our own. I mean, it's a simple photo cell that would be across the stairs of the bus, and as the person tripped the photo cell, it would register a count. Um, you'd have to accumulate those counts at the end of the routes, um, but it wouldn't be that difficult. Again, there, I'm, what, I was, what I was trying to do in envisioning the system was I didn't want to place an additional burden on our drivers. Our drivers have a, have a duty. It's, it's the safety of their students. I, I don't want them to be, if we're going to do this and, and have enough of a database, then it's gonna, it may require some effort. I was trying to think of ways to automate it as best possible. Maybe be a great challenge for some Smith Engineering students. Mr. Moore. Yeah, I was going to say, I think one of the issues that's, that's difficult about this discussion is that it has so many potential threshold issues. You know, the first one is just cost, and I think uh, that's why all of us voted against the proposals placed in the, this report from Tyler was because of the cost. But then the question was, it does, nonetheless, from that report, it looks as though you, there might be ways to do it with less cost, and that way would be if you were doing something based on ridership as opposed to passes. Okay. So then that's a threshold question, is are you willing to do that and make a plan based on ridership versus passes? There's still yet another question, which is the one that you addressed just then, which is, do you want to do a plan like this at all, even if you could afford it, even if, you, you, know, um, you know, because that's the next question. And, you know, it's, it's difficult to organize the discussion because they're all important, they all matter, you know, they're, they're, none of them are, you know, oh well, we'll deal with that later <laughs> kind, of, kind of points, they're all pretty key. Um, myself, I, I, think, I, I think I would be in favor of going ahead with doing the counting because then we'd be discussing something real if, if we found out we couldn't do it, then we're done with the discussion. We don't have to figure out all the other values. If we then find out, well, we could do it, then we have to discuss whether or not we want to. Because the first two questions, whether or not we can, are money. Then the next one is, well, we can eliminate the money if we can do riders instead of passes, but maybe we can't do that either because maybe we have too many riders to be able to do that without spending more money. Then you finally get to the last question. You know, it's a tough question because, you know, the Center for Disease Control recommends getting high school students later because of the, you know, it's a measurable increased risk of traffic fatalities from high school students driving to school when we send our high school students to school right now. You know, every day we're doing that. Um, and no, they, you know, they're driving cars. <laughs> um, and. And, and that's that's the that's the that's the kind of weighing you're doing, and you're, and you're talking about, for example, that's the very longest. I mean, we don't know how long the routes are because we don't have them from Tyler. But right now, our longest elementary routes would be the first route would be on that timetable, and you could shift the whole thing later. You could shift the whole thing later by 10 minutes, say the whole package. Just add 10 minutes to every one of those times, and that gets you to your first bus route would be at seven instead of 10 of seven. You know, that, what that time is, it's interesting. What, what 10 of 7 is, is uh, both in the fall and in the winter, um, it's the beginning of civil dawn, which is the time you're, you're legally allowed to drive without your headlights on, okay? Which, for the very longest route, so there's one route that's that long, all the others are five or 10 minutes shorter, there'd be a couple of weeks where those people would be waiting for the bus right before civil dawn starts. So yeah, it's in the dark. Um, Everybody else on those routes would be later. They'd be during dawn. Um, and so that's that kind of question, as opposed to, like I said, right now, well, you know, all our high school students are driving at a time when the Center for Disease Control recommends they not. 
We also so there's those our, kind of trade-offs that we're talking about. We don't want our seven-year-olds out getting hit by cars because they're out standing by the road when they should Right, be. but with teenagers will be driving right. It, later. It's a to- right, it's, <laughs> you know, it's a toss-up. And No, no, th- and those are the kinds of questions that would be in that discussion, and that's why I would be in favor of doing the doing the measuring of students to see if this is even a possibility because it may not be even a possibility and not really worth our time to have this big discussion about whether or not we want to do that which because it's, it's a, that's a harder discussion than the, than the previous one I think we should do the easiest ones first and if we get to the you know and if one of the easy ones puts an X through the whole plan then we don't have to weigh all these really competing things so could I ask a, a count question? I mean, does our, and I'm going to look at, at Joy Winnie here, is there, d- does our contract allow for the option of asking bus drivers every day to provide a count to just how many people rode their bus that day? Does that, is that even a, something that would, you know? Well, we, the random one that we did that, that uh, Dr. Nash asked us to do, um, it's time consuming. Uh, the drivers obviously have a lot more other things to focus on when they're picking up and dropping off the students. Um, if they did an overall count when they got to the schools in the morning and in the afternoon, which is what they normally do, uh, when they're dropping off, they obviously have to do their counts so that they know where the kids are going when they're crossing and so forth. Um, there's really nothing in our contract that, that says we can or can't ask that information. Uh, my only issue with it is is just the the cumbersomeness of it and the time consuming of it is okay. for the drivers. Okay. This Spinnick. Thank you. <coughs> I, I again I I don't know how to order the decisions either, but I continue to have concerns that. And, and I don't like to, to, I don't intend to pit one age range or one group of families against another. And I find, and I don't know that we can assign a relative value to the well being of one group of students versus another. But I do continue to have concerns that. The elementary and middle school parents have not given us their opinions on on some of this stuff. And it's not just school start time where there's research that says some things that might warrant change, but the hub system continues to have elementary school and high school students on the same bus. And I've heard some People say that they think that that could be very good, but uh, my, my own sense as a parent is that I think that there are going to be a lot of parents who are going to say that they don't think that will be necessarily so good. It's altogether one thing when you've interviewed a babysitter or a trusted friend that you're going to have interact with your kids on a regular basis. It's another thing altogether to put your child on the bus with a random selection of students and while I'd love to believe that all of our high school students will rise to our expectations of them I'm sorry I'm a cynic I guess and I don't necessarily trust that I also I I um, so I I I just I really would like to hear from the parent I also recognize that over the years that we've discussed this, we've been told many times that all students, by the time they get to high school, would benefit from this change. But again, I'm concerned about disadvantaging them significantly in their earlier years, and I don't know how to make that decision. It's sort of like a moral dilemma. It's a Sophie's choice. I, I don't know how to do this without moving everything later and then flipping the schedule on its head so that the elementary kids are starting the earliest but not so early. And you get then to a point where we run into the problems with the sports after school. There just doesn't seem to be a clear answer to this. And we've been chasing our tails for a very long time. And I don't exactly know how to get there. Uh, quick. And what my comments were not intended to pit one age group against another. My comments were intended 
to raise awareness that if we get there, then we still have this other problem and that we need to consider that other problem, not that one age group is more important than the other. I'm just yeah. making, so even if we get there, we still have to do this other stuff that you're right, we haven't heard from anyone. I will comment, it's, 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 it's amusing in a way that right now we have complete equity between the age groups. They're all right. in the wrong time slot. <laughs> right. But that's not really a recommendation, <laughs> okay? Um, and, um, and, and in fact, that's, that, that is another piece of the, what the hub thing is about is because it shortens the amount of time between the first start time and the last start time compared to having three separate tiers. So that it does mean that you don't have to have the last tier be as much later than the first tier or the first tier that much earlier than the last tier. So it, it's as comp it makes it as compressed as possible. And again, the times that are in this form are based on our current um, route length times. And so, again, that if we had an actual plan, you know, an actual transportation plan with actual route lengths, you might find that there is either more compressed or more expanded. I, I couldn't tell you. This is just these, these times, in other words, how long it takes to get from here to there, um, are all based on what it takes now. And so I'm assuming it's pretty close, but. Okay. Ms. Minnick. I, I just, um, to, to follow up on what I was just saying before, I mean, I was around when we made the decision to, sh to move the sixth grade out of the elementary school and put it in middle school. And there were parents who stood in line here just like this evening to tell us that they were very concerned about their sixth graders being on the bus with the eighth graders. Now you tell me that they're not going to be here to tell us that their third graders shouldn't ride with the juniors in high school. I'm, I'm, that really is a serious okay. concern for me. I want parents to have the opportunity to weigh in on that, and I want parents to understand how the changed start times could significantly affect their families and their routines and their schedules. The other thing, however, now what did you just say that I forgot already what my point was? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Pardon? I said we equally disadvantage everybody, yeah. which is not a good thing. And I said, the, the, the reason for a hub as opposed to just doing three tiers and flipping people around in the order yeah. is that it's, it's the most compressed you can get. I think I forgot whatever my point was, so I'll, if I think of it, I'll raise my So hand. just to be clear, the committee's recommendation to the full school committee or the, uh, was that the, the hub plan as currently proposed, would, they would not favor it? Yes. Okay. So that's the recommendation. So now the sort of the decision point that you've presented us with is to, to wait and see how the budget shakes out to see whether, you know, weigh it against do we think we can, you know, we want to pay that cost to get there. And then, and then your other recommendation is do we um, try to do a count so that we can determine whether we can even winnow down the number of buses even further or right. to ridership which, which might have absolutely nothing to do with start time it might just be we find out that we can get by with one fewer bus that's fifty thousand dollars that's mm -hmm. yeah real money okay. so but that that's that's a separate yeah. question it may be helpful to start time but it's not necessarily linked okay. mr oh go ahead just a clarifying question being new to this process what is the what's the data on the ideal start time for an elementary student if it's not, if I it's don't not know. All I now. know is all I know is that there was a letter that we got like two months ago from the administrative leadership team that pointed out that a, that the a start time for in, in the in the plan that they were opposing at the time, which started the elementary school I think ten minutes later than it currently does, was developmentally inappropriate. I mean, so I don't know more than that. And the reason I ask is, I mean, I only have a three and a half year old, but I have to get him to school right now at eight fifteen, and it's nearly impossible to get out of the house at that time. So I'm, you know, and that's, there's several years and hopefully some developmental leaps. Socks. But I'm just trying, right, you know. <laughs> but I'm just trying to kind of imagine kindergarten, I mean, there's a range, you know, kindergarten to fifth grade is a really big difference. So, I don't know. Okay, so Ms. Duvall and then back to Ms. When I was on the ad hoc, um, the late start ad hoc committee, one of the things that I did was ask the elementary, um, a couple of the elementary principals as far as the, that question what would be an okay time to start with and I basically got 830 
as far as no earlier if you start doing that you're running into issues with them so they the, the range was 815 to 830 and, and that was basically would be the ideal for the elementary according to the administrators that I asked in the different the different schools so Ms. Mack okay so two things sometimes when we have this discussion about roots and students and stuff it makes me wonder if we should be redistricting again maybe and I mean I hate to even say those words it goes because it makes people go berserk but we haven't done that in how long 18 years we've we've evened out our enrollment inequities through school choice but if we're gonna bust open the whole thing maybe we should just be looking at it and maybe we should consider redistricting and maybe that would open up all kinds of other bus route uh, issues. possibilities or issues <laughs> one way or the other so I'm just yeah. I'm just saying it I that, think I think that would be perfect for the next superintendent <laughs> <laughs> that and and evaluating uh, the long block at the high school are my two things that I just keep wondering someday if we shouldn't think about those things but uh, to be to be more specific about what we're supposed to be discussing here um, we took a vote and the high school is supposed to be changing its start time come September. Mm -hmm. We need to kind of, you know, whether we decide to do a study of ridership or a hub system or whatever, I, I think we kind of, I think our, what we're supposed to be figuring out is whether we can stick with that or whether we have to change that vote. Well, that's the, the, the trick is, if that's been the issue is to then implement the, the vote that the committee took last year. Right, we already took the vote. And so we've been, now this is another attempt well, I mean, to, try to, we, to try to implement. I don't know if we have time to implement it. Yeah. I mean, the original proposal, we got here because the proposal that was presented by mm -hmm. the last ad hoc committee sort of fell apart, and so then we switched back to the hub exploration, or we went to the hub exploration, and now we're to the, or at least we're at a decision point on that, and it sounds like, at least from the committee, that that's not a favorable recommendation at this point. So. I just think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on it. Yeah, there is. I think, you know, I think when Downey was giving our little committee report there, you pointed out that that was the other issue which we haven't discussed, which was the other question about transportation to the high school. And I think that was, that's a budget and property question, and it's and it's going to it's going to get a it's, it's either going to sort of sit out there or it's going to come into focus depending on our actual numbers. Um, and that then. It's again. It's one of those things. What order? Because if there's no transportation to the high school, then then all of a sudden, then you know the start time for the high school can be announced the day before, and they can do it. You know, because there's, you know, it, you know, we're we're still talking about a really relatively small range. Um, we're talking about 7:30 now, versus at, I think no later than 8:15 probably. So, you know, we're not talking about really anything if you're not talking about the if you're not trying to mesh it in with our bosses um, in terms of implementation, it'd be fairly straightforward. But we won't really know that. We won't need to have that discussion at all. I don't think anybody's in favor of eliminating transportation to the high school. Um, I mean, just as a good idea. <laughs> but, but, but it may be something we have to do as part of the budget process. And so I think that we should wait on just all of that until we actually know what our budget numbers are. So, um, so then, it, so is that a rec? Well, is that a recommendation that we defer the the, the question of the on the question of our start time vote? I think yes, okay. that's my recommendation. Okay. What's your recommendation? I just start time vote. There's the the right. one we voted on last year. Right. That we that we not revisit that until we because it, it we change drastically. We don't have a transportation plan to implement that now. Right, because there was no transportation to the high school and we all voted on it. Yeah. Right. But we knew that was going to be it. We decided that already. Right. I mean, so, so we, so we uh, voted yeah. knowing that. I understand that. Okay. Like Howard said we should delay the vote or defer the vote. I'm just saying, what, what are we... Oh. There's no well, the, thing, yeah. the yeah. thing that Lisa was okay. talking about, about do we want to revisit the question of, of the mandate to change the start time, and the answer is wait and see. I, we, we don't know what our budget's going to be. 
Well, we also don't have all the facts either until we go and decide whether we're going to do actual ridership versus a percentage of the ridership um, so versus know. redistricting yeah. versus a four-day school week. Okay. The concern is that's going to take a little bit more time. Okay. So. Exactly. How about I make a motion here? I'm going to make a motion that we um, that we ask, that we that we uh, implement a, a count. And, and we'll figure out the details later, but a count of actual ridership of our buses. Second. Okay. I missed the beginning of that, I'm sorry. That, we'll, that we vote to have a count Start of counting. actual ridership of our buses, so we have a, another piece of actual fact as opposed to conjecture. For, for how long? Well, let's start it and, you know. Stop it when we want. Stop it when we want, no. <laughs> I think well, Downey was saying a year. It would be for now until, the, until, as soon as we can get it going until the end of this. Yeah, it yeah, doesn't matter when you start. You start, and then you just continue. Look at it, revisit yeah, it. Okay. saying when we start, it's, it's when, we, when we're saying we're going to end. You know, like you said a year, right? That was originally suggested. Well, and if we're talking about changing the start time of the high school in September, you know, then it's, we don't have a year. No, I think, I think that the ridership data, if that was what you were going to base your decision on, I do not believe that you would have it before the end of the year. Right. Every committee member would have that choice, but. Mainly because the ridership changes. From season to season. Right. From season to season. And certainly this winter would have been the ideal time to capture the most, the majority of people riding. I'm sure more people were riding this winter. It's snowing more. Yeah. Okay. So there's been a motion, there's a motion on the table, uh, seconded by Mr. Meyer, uh, to 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 implement um, a, a ridership count, uh, and with the details to be defined, but that that's the takeaway from that. So, what's that? With with that with that information having no bearing on the start time for this September, but to be used at a further date to perhaps use in order to continue a discussion on the hub system or well, right because so right for our current transportation yeah, yeah, transportation plan so we're dealing with actual numbers Data. as sure. to sure but just yes. to be clear that it's separate from yeah. trying to solve the start time issue for this September because it, it won't have any bearing on that correct it has to right and I think that's what that's I mean, what you. I mean, the motion was very simple. Just said yeah, we're going to start sure. counting riders. Sure, you can <laughs> use that information use it any way you want. Use okay. it not. <laughs> this minute. What, what are we? Is implied in that motion? It, what if there's a cost involved? Are we are we talking cost to to do this potentially, or are we, what are we? I'm imagining that there may be some cost if we had to use you know Arduino boards that cost thirty four dollars each times nine buses. That's three hundred dollars plus some sensors. There could be some cost. Could we ask Ms. Winnie if that's appropriate to be putting on buses, or do we have to first? Well, now, now we're getting into contractual issues because now <clears throat> we're putting equipment that first we have to have uh, okayed by the Registry of Motor Vehicles because we're not allowed to put anything on the buses that the registry doesn't first say, yeah, it's okay, because the Registry of Motor Vehicles and the D. D, uh, DOT, they have full control over what's put on the buses and what isn't put on the buses, okay? The second thing is um, the contractor. We would have to get permission from the contractor to allow us to do that and, because that's presently not in our language, in our contract. So there's uh, a few dicey patches there that uh, would have to be looked into. But the biggest one would be the registry. Mm -hmm. And um, I can tell you now that the registry frowns on um, the bus drivers decorating their buses. Uh, so, because it's not original equipment. So we would, we would make uh, sure before we, we would, got the we would equipment. We with all applicable right. federal, state, and yeah. municipal laws. Okay. I think that's implicit in the motion. Okay. <laughs> I hope it is. We don't do it. Legal <laughs> took an oath. Um, yeah. So we have a motion on the table. Did you have a comment, Ms. Minnick? I do. Uh, I I was going to say that I was going to vote against it because I don't want to instruct someone to do it without giving some parameters on how it's going to get done. And that was that was a very general motion, intentionally, I think. Mm -hmm. But I think 
that made it unpalatable to me to say, go out and count those kids <laughs> and not provide the resources or say how they're going to do it. I think that if you, uh, you know, I would be in favor of a motion that said we're going to authorize collecting the count of people, but instructing someone to do it, I'm not going to vote in favor. Okay. I'd be happy with that amendment. <laughs> What's that? I, I, think what, I think the question was, we're going to have to undertake some investigation to see whether it's possible and what the cost would be. That was the, the only question was whether, the question was whether you even were interested in doing the count. You weren't voting, you weren't appropriating money, you weren't instructing the transportation supervisor to do anything. You're just saying, would like that to happen. Me to invest my valuable time in seeing whether or not this is possible. I'll do it volunteer, zero cost. The investigation part. I would authorize it. Howard says that that's an okay amendment. If he wants to accept <laughs> it as a friend of the amendment, I'd be happy for that to happen. Downey Meyer shall count the number of. I'm going to be out there. No, click. I mean, not down the wire. Click, click, I'm just click. authorizing versus <laughs> instructing is, is the only request I'm making. Okay. Okay. So are you comfortable? So uh, the, the you wanted a slight friendly, friendly amendment. Uh, and so you're, are you accepting of the friendly now amendment? What is, now what does this motion that we're voting on say? It says authorize. We authorize collecting a count, not instruct them to make a count. Okay, sure. Okay. Does it mean they're going to make a count? Did you get that phrase? It means they're going to investigate and come back to us and say, so the it's motion. as much do you still want it? Or so the motion is to authorize the school department to, um, to. We, we authorize them to, or, or you can say that you move that they, that we instruct them to investigate what it would cost to make. I don't think authorize is good, I mean, you know, and I think Everybody can assume that we mean it as cost effective and as efficient and as um, friendly a m way, way as possible. So, could you, could someone restate the. Uh, the <laughs> Howard, restate it for Just us. for Tracy's uh, um, so she can write it down. Okay. The motion is that, that we authorize, the school committee authorizes um, the collection of data of actual ridership on our nine Durham buses. And I, sec I second it. Okay. Howard, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the end of that. I'll be. Uh, authorize the collection on our. I mean, I'm I'm going to undertake to see the most cost-effective way. I will, I will undertake myself if the transportation supervisor wishes. So are you now in the, the motion? <laughs> I got no. it. He was just. He was just. I think, just I think Tracy right. was asking if he was in it. No, he's not. In it. Okay, so it's just authorizing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded, and made again and seconded. Um, <laughs> is there any other discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Okay, um, is there any other items that your committee is reporting to us? Uh, okay, Chris, so we'll move on now to the uh, Business, oh, actually, let's see. We, we wanted to now move to the district calendar discussion. Yes. yes. Um, so we will now just take up the district calendar discussion that we deferred till after this Versa Tran discussion. All right. Thank you, Ms. Winnie, you for being with us. Thank you very much for Thank coming, you. Ms. Winnie. <laughs> the um, calendar for the 2014 2015 school year looks remarkably similar to this year's calendar um, with actually just one day difference with regard to the beginning and the ending so as you look at it uh, Northampton starts their school year after uh, Labor Day so the first day is September 2nd uh, we have the same contingencies with regard to building in five days for snow um, and the ending date, if all went well and there were no snow day issues next year, uh, would be getting out on June 17th. This year we were slated to get out on June 18th. Um, so that's sort of how it looks like. The traditional um, <coughs> February and April vacations are in in the usual places. And the, uh, everyone wants to know about the um, holiday recess in December. And it's just the reverse of what we did this year. Um, because now 
um, we would be going to school Monday and Tuesday, the 22nd and 23rd of December, um, not going to school the 24th through the 2nd, uh, and then returning on Monday the 5th. So there isn't really a lot of wiggle room in this calendar when you start after Labor Day. It, it is what it is. Um, you see all the, all the regular holidays. Um, there are some times for, <coughs> for late starts um, for testing, and you also see some um, teacher professional days and um, parent-teacher conferences as usual. So it's really, I have last year's, the current year's calendar with me. It's really the same calendar. Move to approve. Okay, is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay, any questions or discussion? Uh, Mrs. Minnick, you had a question. I just want to be certain that as far as, um, and I mean, I guess it's not critical with, with this calendar, but I want to be sure that you've looked at um, religious holidays. Yes. Scheduled we, on. We did look at those, and we made some changes appropriately. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Moore? Yeah, I'd like to address the school hours. Uh, again, I think it, 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 this will depend upon the budget and the busing and the whole, you know, all the stuff that ends up happening down the road. Um, you know, I, I hesitate to vote for it. I think when you vote for the calendar, I think it's uh, pretty important people hang their hat on it. Um, I, I think it's really good to vote on the calendar early. However, I think the school hours thing, particularly if it happens as a result of busing at the high school being eliminated, um, which I hope doesn't happen, but um, if that should happen, that would be a relatively minor change in the overall calendar. So um, I, would, um, I would move to remove the school hours block from what we are voting on here tonight. I'll take that as a friendly amendment. <laughs> no, that's my motion that we can remove it and accept it with the back on. I think that would be fine. I have no problems with that, but I do need an approved calendar. Exactly, so. and that's what I'm saying. I'm, yeah. okay. I believe it's a really good thing to get it done. Right. Okay. So, um, so you're. I'll change the motion to to in, include um, taking out the school hours. Yeah. Okay. So the and the, uh, and the seconder is still seconding. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So then the motion then is to approve the calendar, uh, but minus that block that includes the times, because that's still an open question. All those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the calendar as amended is approved. Um, now we'll move to the uh, various reports, business report and personnel report. Um, I just want to indicate that um, we have scheduled a meeting with the Budget and Property Subcommittee for next Thursday um, for having an initial discussion of the FY15 budget. And um, I see no reason why we will not be back on track, so we have a full committee meeting on Thursday, March 27th, which will be related to the budget. Um, I might also just indicate that there is still uh, on the current busing situation we have, the increase for next year is uh, $60,000. That's without anything to do with hub busing. It's just where we are now going into next year by contract. That's $60,000. I think you also heard tonight that there is um, a need for um, some professional development, more than we're having now. And I would just um, put in my pitch for the fact that if we um, have enough money um, for um, another $84,000 for transportation. We might also think about do we have also enough money to do professional development the way it should be done, and would that be a better use of $84,000? So that's my pitch. Uh, more to be discussed later. Okay. Um, personnel sheet is also in your packet. We have, uh, let's see, three, six, nine, eleven 11 new hires, so it goes on. Um, three people left us, no retirements, and no promotion or transfers. Okay. Great. So that completes those two reports. And now I would ask uh, Mr. Zahowski to give an update on the superintendent search. Well, glad that you asked. Um, I'm pleased to uh, let you all know that the superintendent screening committee has completed its work. Um, and I'd like to publicly thank 
the screening committee for their time and professionalism during the screening process. Um, one member still out in the audience. Pam was a member along with myself. Um, we spent the last three nights uh, hard at work. Um, and so I'd like to say thank you to you who are here and those who may be watching at home or will read about it that um, I'm very grateful for the time and the commitment that everybody put into. And I'm pleased to say that the committee worked very well together and we were able to achieve our goal. Um, so I've contacted uh, Mr. Bill Erickson with NESDEC uh, with the news uh, that we've completed our process as a screening committee. And uh, he's contacted all the applicants that we interviewed and he's personally thanked them for their time and coming in and spending um, uh, what was approximately an hour um, speaking to us about um, the willingness to consider um, coming to work in Northampton. He's also informed our finalists of our desire to have them continue in the process and I'd like to at least say at this time that they've all accepted and moving forward. So um, as you may know by um, looking at your calendars, we have another meeting scheduled Monday the 17th um, and it's at that time of the special meeting of the school committee that I'll be announcing publicly uh, the finalists. And at that time, um, Art Bendencourt with uh, NESDEC will join us. He'll talk to us about ne next steps in the process and hopefully get those finalist interviews scheduled as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, any questions uh, about the report on the screening committee? No, I just had a question in the meeting on Monday night. Is it at 7.15 here as usual? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I don't believe we have any new business. Uh, in terms of future business and meeting dates, actually, well, we just noted the meeting um, that is on Monday the 17th at 7.15 here. That's the special meeting uh, related specifically to the... Uh, to the superintendent search process. We then have the training meeting on March 19th at 7.30 here at JFK. Uh, and then our next um, regularly scheduled school committee meeting is March 27th, uh, 2014, which will be devoted to uh, the FY15 budget. Um, so that concludes the regular business on the agenda I so far. One other thing to say, I wanted to say thank you to Tracy as well, because she was part of the committee, uh -huh. and I singled out Pam and uh, Sharon out in the uh, audience, but I didn't mention Tracy, Excellent. so I apologize no for problem. that, Tracy. Nope. It's been a long week for all of us, but a very productive week, so thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, so now we have scheduled on our agenda uh, an executive session uh, in the JFK Principals Conference Room. Uh, and I would ask um, uh, for a motion, and specifically <coughs> that, if that motion, if you could read the, uh, the, the purpose on there. I move to adjourn to the executive session in, in the conference room under Massachusetts general law open meeting for the approval of executive sessions minutes September 11th, September 12th, September 16th, September 25th of 2013, and February 24th, and two from March 3rd of 2014, as well as Chapter 30A, Section 21A, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. Macy. Okay. We've got a motion made. Uh, is there a second? A second. Okay. Uh, and I will ask the clerk to call the roll uh, to move into executive session. Yes. Ms. Ann Hennessy. Okay. Mr. Downey Meyer. Aye. Ms. Lisa Minnick. Yes. Mr. Howard Moore. Yes. Yes. Mr. Andy Shelton. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Ball. Yes. Mayor David Hart. Yes. Okay, so that motion carries, and I need to announce to the public uh, that we are moving into executive session because to have these discussions um, about these two particular um, items, uh, uh, to hold them in an open session, uh, compromise uh, the city's uh, position with respect to bargaining. Um, I also want to announce that uh, we will adjourn from executive session. We will not return to open session. So those are the two public announcements I want to make. And now we can actually uh, adjourn to the conference room for the executive session.